All right, I'd like to call to order the Tuesday, April 12th, 2022 meeting of the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee. And the first item on our agenda is some special recognition. <clears throat> and I will turn it over to Superintendent Martineau on that. All right. Just gonna take my, my special position, so I think not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> Mr. Martino. So, on behalf of the public schools of North Rome, South Row, I want to thank you for years of service. <clears throat> I think it was 2009 when you joined the committee, and you've had been a positive impact and have made a difference. Um, and I think service is such an important aspect of being a great citizen. And, um, I think you've modeled that over your career, so I want to thank you. Thank they you. have three quotes. Uh oh. Yes, guess who these quotes are from. <laughs> <laughs> Play along with me. <laughs> so, um, the first quote is Life is for service. Any, any ideas who said that? It's kind of a very open ended. So, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. Mr. Yeah, all right. So, okay. The next quote is Life's journey, um, according to Mr. Rogers things to remember along the way. So that was the, the first quote. Mm -hmm. So the next quote is, strive not to be a success, but rather to be a value. Any idea who said that? So Albert Einstein said, ah, yeah. all right. great value to the community, so, so thank you. And a success. So. And lastly, this quote is, treating others with dignity, mm -hmm. having a sense of humility, understanding the importance of people's contributions, and letting everyone know they're valued members of the organization. Any ideas? So that is from Chris Kalenda. Oh, my brother. Oh. Dan's brother. And I think um, who's an author of um, Leadership, the Warrior's Art. Mm -hmm. um, and I yeah. think you've exemplified leadership in our community and service. So, thank you, Greg. Um, thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of the oh, wow. legislative delegation, we also have a certificate signed oh. by President of the Senate, Chair Karen Spilka, mm -hmm. um, the Clerk, Michael Hurley, and the State Sen Senator James B. Eldridge. And it says, be it known that the Massachusetts Senate hereby extends its congratulations to Daniel L. Kalenda, North Coast Southboro Regional School Committee. Be it further known that the Massachusetts Senate extends its best wishes for continued success. This citation be duly signed by the President of the Senate and tested to, and a copy thereby transmitted by the Clerk of the Senate. So. Awesome. And lastly, a small gift um, for you on behalf of the district. So we weren't sure what size you were, shoe, so. <laughs> anyway, no, small, that is a heavy fruitcake. Small token. Cake. That is small token. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all. I appreciate a, it. Not a clock for now. Okay. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that was very kind. And a couple words, if I may. I'll be brief. By all means. <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, thank you, Mr. Martineau, and to my fellow members. Um, I, I do remember starting this journey back in 2009. I was fortunate to be appointed to, uh, there was a vacancy on the committee and I had just gotten back from Iraq and I remember um, saying when I was there in Iraq and, and you know, and, and we were part of, uh, you know, the US military was part of helping make it possible for the Iraqis to vote uh, in an actual democracy and they would stick their you know, finger in the in the purple ink, and that was a hey, I voted, and they were so proud. I mean, they went through multiple security checks um, to be able to get to a place to vote in in relative safety, but they risked their lives literally to vote. And I said, you know, I I've never participated in my democracy in 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 you know in in that extent. I mean, I vote, but I wanted to. When I saw that, I said, I want to participate in a, in a greater way. And so part of that, I think, is yes, voting, but also looking for opportunities to serve your town. And I found that in the Regional School Committee and then as a member of the Board of Selectmen. And um, it's been incredibly rewarding. Uh, 
you know, what, what's it, 12 plus years uh, doing this is a lot of time. And, and you know, you're all doing it and, and you know the time and effort it takes, but it's incredibly valuable work. And just that's the only message I have is to others who, you know, the, the, our, our large audience that may be listening. Um, but, you know, for those here, just encourage others um, to run, to be, you know, to, to give back to, to your towns and, and to our community. And, and, you know, service is a great thing. Those are some awesome quotes that you provided. And, you know, doing something for others is incredibly rewarding. And I've been fortunate to be able to do that here with you all for so long. So thank you for the wonderful recognition. It's undeserving, but have greatly appreciated. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else? Have anything? Joe? Uh, Dan, I'd like to thank you for your service on this committee, but I think even more important is, as uh, Greg said, Fred Rogers said, life is a service. You have given your life to our country also and helped us um, in good times and in bad times. And we've missed you in the time when you were serving a higher level and you were away from us. And I know last year, I think it was about this time, I wrote a, a letter on behalf of the entire community uh, yep. committee when you achieved the rank of Colonel. Colonel. And um, I'd just like to thank you for that service because I think that is something that is so well earned and deserved. And it was time away also from your family. But I think more important than that is what serving on this committee is we all have different viewpoints and we should mm -hmm. but we have an open discussion uh, and we listen to each other and um, we try to understand the other per person's viewpoint and then we all make our decision based on our own conscience mm -hmm. but I've enjoyed working with you on the committee I think that any member that's on here makes us a better person and we listen and understand we can disagree but then we always leave as friends mm -hmm. You so do. whatever the next part of your life takes you, and you have a lot of good years and a lot of good service, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you've done for our country and for the students of Algonquin Regional High School and Southboro when you served on K-Day. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Joan. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. I'll add my two cents, I guess. 2009, that's a long time. <clears throat> but, um, what really struck me, I guess, was you, know, you were on the Regional School Committee, ran for selectman, and I thought, well, now that he's a selectman, there's no way he's going to run for school committee again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you proved me wrong multiple times, so you know, I, I just, I, I don't know how you did it, but I'm just really glad you did. So thank you, Dan, for many, many years of service. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Um, with the will of the committee, we'd like to move up the public hearing on school choice to right now and to be followed by the regular public, public comment. If, uh, Everyone's okay with that? So I will open the public hearing on school choice. If anyone has any, any comment on our vote tonight, we're going to be voting on, on whether to participate in the school choice or not. Um, so now's the time if anyone in the audience wants to chime in on that. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing on school choice and open it up for a public comment on uh, any school-related matter for any member of the audience. And seeing none, we will move ahead to the regular agenda and action on minutes. Um, I'll take a motion uh, to approve the open meeting minutes of March 16th, 2022. So moved. Second. Moved by Dan, seconded by Joan. <clears throat> Any comments? All in favor? That is unanimous. That moves us to educational policy. We have none at this time, so on to new business. And first item is the athletic complex presentation by Gail Associates. Sure, so I'll provide some context and turn it over to um, Keith Lavoy. So first of all, um, we're very thankful for Gail Associates and uh, its work over the past eight months doing schematic design and engineering around an uh, athletic complex project. Um, in this evening, they're here to present um, schematic drawings <coughs> and design and a cost proposal. Um, for us, it's really the first step in a much long-term long, uh, project in terms of getting feedback and input and buy-in from our stakeholders. And tonight really starts that journey forward. And I will share that this journey has been um, a many-year journey. It started in 2013 and pro probably prior to that. Um, Gale Associates did some work around uh, conditions assessment of the field, the track, um, and made some recommendations in 2013 
that basically said upgrades need to take place, and that was almost a decade, a little under a decade ago. So um, it is time, um, and we're very excited to have Gail Associates present, and I'll turn it over to Keith. Yes, thank you, Greg. Um, so like Greg said, we really wanted to uh, step up the review of the athletic complex and make sure we had all available information, not only for the committee, but for the public to understand the current condition and then also what was going to be necessary to, to bring it up to a serviceable level. So um, I am happy to introduce Kathy Herbel. She is one of the project managers at Gale Associates who has dig deep into our project. We actually literally did some digging with some core samples of the area to understand what is underneath um, our failed track and also you know collecting all the recommendations that she has so she has a series of slides that she's going to prevent present we also have some drawings that are available for uh, a greater look and then she'll be available for <coughs> questions after so probably be best to do a little migration and Kathy I'll invite you up and you're, you're going to stand right, Kathy? That probably makes the most sense. Yeah, she'll probably stand right to your right, Paul. And I'll do the driving. Yes. So, Kathy, it's all yours. All right. I just want to thank the school committee for having us here this evening um, and to get you um, up to speed on this very exciting project. And I hope you know, we gain your support and you can understand why a project like this is needed at this time. Um, with the school and the facilities um, as old as they've gotten and um, the repairs that are needed. Thank you. Um, just a quick agenda. Um, we're going to explain what we've done to date um, for the project, take you a little bit through the existing conditions, some of the concerns, some of the issues at the existing fields. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about similar projects that we've done, um, the master plan process that we've worked through with the school and some of the booster groups. Um, I'll take you into the schematic designs, the process we kind of went through with the school, um, programming the numerous meetings to get input from people. Um, hit on an amphitheater, kind of a more a community-wide type portion that we would like to add to the project um, based on input from the, the team. Um, and then take you through our, our schematic um, design costs and then just hit a little bit on some athletic lighting and such and we do have some detailed slides of you know what a turf field looks like and that that we can get into for those of you who don't know what they look like underneath and things along those lines what they involve so um, next slide please um, so what have we completed to date um, we did our evaluations of the field um, we did them as um, he said many years ago um, but we've gone back out. We were, you know, to go back out and see where we really are at. Um, we also did an existing conditions survey. What this does is um, we do the topography, all the existing conditions, basically utilities, what's in the way, what are we going to run into in construction. You know, try to eliminate all the surprises that we have. These <coughs> surveys are then taken, and this is our base plan for our design that we put the schematic design on. We did extensive. Um, geotechnical work, we did cores in the track, the tennis courts, we did <coughs> test pits um, throughout the fields, which it's information we need to understand the drainage, but also as we advance the design, we need that information as well. Um, and also we did um, borings, so we have athletic lighting proposed, you need to design those foundations, they're a fairly high you know, light pole, and um, that's why we did that. Then we get into our schematic design and our cost estimates. Um, I have examples of the cost estimates here. Obviously, the team has them as well, but you, you'll get a sense to see how much detail we go into these, even at the schematic level, because we just try to account for everything so that as the school moves forward and plans for this project, we don't have any surprises. Next slide, please. This is just, it's not the best value, but this is just a quick view of our existing conditions sur survey, all the elevations, the utilities, um, irrigation lines, all of those types of things. Next slide. Um, so let's talk a little bit, you know, why, why we're here. Well, the track was installed in 1994. Um, your average track, which is maintained, usually recoded every eight years or so, will last like 18 years. This track has not, been resurfaced and um, is in really bad repair. Its useful life has ended, not just the surface of the track, but your paving as well. It's just underneath is asphalt paving, just like a road or a parking lot, and after time, it deteriorates and needs to be replaced. So with the um, 
and you can see some pictures of the, um, the, the track. It holds water. And this one, the far end is a little hard to see, but it does show patching throughout the track um, and just a little bit of what the existing field looks like. But with the track being in such poor shape, um, it's basically going to need to be um, completely pulverized and um, reworked, reconstructed. Next slide, please. Um, and then the existing J field, B field um, has been, you know, used as well as the football field. You know, these grass fields have been used forever. They get used um, a tremendous amount, and they get overcompacted from being played on. Eventually, the topsoil can't produce grass. The surfaces get um, ruddy. You get the clumps of grass. Um, not only does it not fun to play on, and the balls don't go as well, but it can get it can become a safety concern as well. Next slide. Um, and then the tennis courts, as you can see, are is definitely in, in really need of repair. Um, we've got significant cracking um, on level areas and um, you know, even around fence poles and stuff, we've seen heaving in that that again, this was um, installed in 2004. So you're you know, you're out 18 years or so. Next slide. This is just some similar projects that Gail has worked on, um, very similar to yours. You can see kind of the normal one is exactly track and field, the practice field turf. Um, tr um, Gail has done over 245 turf fields in this area. Um, you can pretty much go down Metro West and um, you know the Boston area, and there's a field that we've done. Um, so we just wanted to let you know we, we've done those. We've done over 50 tennis court projects. Um, so this is what we do, and um, this, um, just so you know, we, you know, we're excited to work on this project, and um, we're going to do the best job. Next, please. Um, this was the master plan, as they talked about. This started back in 2013 and evolved. I think this was finally kind of finalized in 2020. Um, again, looking at the new track, a turf um, stadium field, turf practice field, and then the new tennis courts. Next, please. Okay, so into our schematic design. This is um, what we're proposing here. First off, as we said, the track's in really bad shape. It's got to be basically reconstructed from the, from the beginning. Um, the existing track right now has a radius on um, these ends here of 104. What that does is limit how wide, because the radio, how wide your fields can be. So fields like lacrosse and soccer get very tight to that track. What we like to try to do or what they look for you to do is provide a 10-foot runout area at the end of that, you know, the painted line of the field to the track to, for safety for kids. You don't want them running off. Now, granted, most of these fields that were all built early on, lacrosse didn't really exist back then, and, and the tracks were all done with a lot smaller radius. So what this opportunity, since the track's got to be completely rebuilt, we're going to increase the radius so that we can um, increase the playing area, um, but also doing a new track gives you the great opportunity to come in and do a turf field um, to tie in the drainage around the inside of the track. It's just a, a good um, mix. So we're, um, like I said, we're proposing a brand new track um, and then coming in with the turf field. We also have um, Bleachers, new bleachers proposed. Um, that would include a press box, and you're required to have a lift so that um, people with handicap ADA can get up to the press box, um, not through the bleachers. Um, we're improving the drainage system. There's a whole detailed, basically, um, grid of drainage that goes under these fields, So, which is why, when it's raining, you can play with them, because they just basically infiltrate immediately the water and allows the kids to play on it, whether it's wet or whatever. Um, this, we're proposing some new athletic lighting. Your lights now, um, you know, they work, but they're low, um, and they shine across the field. It's not the best for playing conditions. All new athletic lighting's a little bit higher, shines more directly down on, on the fields. And also, um, I'll show you a little later in the presentation, what that also does is keep the light from going to say neighbors and things along those lines. If instead of the light shining across the field, it shines down and not off like school property and have impacts and such. Luckily, these fields are kind of isolated. There are some neighbors up to the, um, the far end of the, the track and that, but most of the fields are pretty isolated. So we're improving the ADA um, access, um, site fencing, we've got safety netting, um, 
and that's um, really this is the <coughs> schematic design for the stadium field. Next slide. This is the JV field. Um, this is going to be a turf field. Um, again, fencing, safety netting. We're going to provide some portable bleachers, athletic lighting. Um, and just keep in mind these fields are used by numerous, numerous teams. You know, you have, you have all your high school sports with, you know, you got ninth grade JV, varsity, and then multiply it times three sports. Um, field usage obviously is a, um, a high commodity and um, adding lights just gives everybody that much more playing time um, for um, the, the community as well and the possibility obviously that, you know, other teams could come in, youth groups and things like that. Um, again, improving the drainage will provide all um, regulation type soccer field, you know, field dimensions. Um, those are all based on the nat National um, High School um, Federation of Fields as well as the MIAA. Um, and the only other thing I want to point out, we've got a couple um, proposed locations for the amphitheater on this. You can see the little kind of half circle up above and the one down below. Um, and we're also considering a location on the other side of the, um, the track and field that um, might be utilized. Next slide. And this is the tennis court um, schematic design, um, basically replacing the existing nine courts, you know, in kind, in place. Um, but again, um, this pavement and um, surfacing is as bad as the track and would be basically be redone completely. But what we try to do is we um, pulverize and then we reclaim the, the asphalt and use it as the sub base. It does, it is a cost saving measure. Um, and then, you know, bring up to whatever section we, we design for as the final pavement and then, you know, do your track surface. Um, again, ADA, um, improved access to, to the courts, gates and such. And um, that's really it. The only other thing we have found too, um, we show some um, saw cuts through the tennis court, we've learned in New England, tennis courts don't do very well. They crack um, fairly easily, um, no matter um, how good you put them in and they need to be treated. But we have found that these saw cuts through experience help direct the cracks and such and keep it from the plain areas as much as possible to prolong your, your before you may have to recoat tennis courts. Next slide. And then just uh, hit a little bit on the electrical. What we've tried to do is, you know, working with the team is advance um, our thoughts, you know, what the school might want to do later. Um, with minimal cost, what we were able to do, instead of just providing electrical to the um, upgraded electrical for the lights at the JV field and the um, stadium field, we even, we can, um, we're gonna upgrade the service to the field house that it can then be expanded to the baseball field and also the tennis courts if in the future that becomes um, more of a, a need or a desire by the school and, and more of a demand. Um, so basically we've, we've already done our preliminary electrical line. We've worked with the facilities, Mr. <coughs> Gorman, um, you know, to where we can run the lines and um, again, just trying to plan for the future as well. Um, do it now so then it's all sitting there, you know, later. Next slide. And then this is just the electrical for the, for the um, stadium field, running to the lights, um, the press box, and um, the, um, we also have some what they call com boxes in the field that allows them to come in, like if you have a special event, they can plug in electrical, like speakers or um, scoreboards or whatever, announcing um, type mechanisms. Um, and that's the next slide. And this is just to give you a sense of the amphitheater that they're um, considering. We've gone kind of, we kind of worked with the team and kind of gave them some ideas, but the thought is maybe some small community concerts and, or, you know, the school, school bands, things along those lines so that the project isn't, you know, just for athletes, it's, it's for everybody. Next slide. And then this is um, our cost. We looked at the cost for the, the project in, in a three-phase approach as well as just as if it were to move ahead as one large project. The biggest difference in the cost is really just your mobilization and then demobilization of your contractor. Um, that's really, and there isn't a huge difference, um, but you know, you're looking in the realm of um, you know, 7.6 if it's done in the three-phase approach and you know, not much different, 7.55 you know, if you do it in the, um, the um, overall uh, approach. Um, 
we estimate that this project, the overall, all the project could be done in four months or so. Um, so um, sometimes it's, you get a better deal from the GCs if you do it all at once. But you know, obviously that's something that the, the, the school and the, the town will have to evaluate, so. And then this is just to give you an example. I just said, I talked about earlier about the lights, how now they shine down. Um, this is just an example. Moscow does a lot of athletic lighting, but you can just see how it shines on the field and when you just go off the edge, um, you know, it gets dark. In fact, we've planned for some walkways and lighting on the walkways as well because it does become an issue, you know, as soon as you leave the field. But just to give you a sense and how it wouldn't impact neighbors and such. And that's um, really it. I'd like to take some questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you. Karen? Thank you. This is awesome um, and exciting. I have a question about the bleachers and why sure. they would be portable. Um, the bleachers at the um, soccer field would be portable. The other bleachers are okay. permanent, big grandstand, okay. stadium type, yes. The soccer field, we have those portable um, just so they could get moved around depending if there's some events and things like that and then they could actually be used elsewhere so we tend to you know propose some portable bleachers okay so, yep Kelly thank you um, it's really wonderful to see very comprehensive and I had a few questions about the possibility of solar powering for the lights we actually um, have looked into that several times um, unfortunately the amount you would need from the solar power the lights the lights yeah. need quite a large load to, to run and the solar power without investing in a really large like kind of battery system storage system for the power um, we have found it um, not feasible in okay, fact yeah. um, I'm trying to think uh, on another project I had that same exact question and I did speak with Moscow lighting if it's been done anywhere if they've seen it done anywhere and they're like it just you, you just can't it, it, it gets cost prohibitive to, to provide that type of battery system and such, so. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. Um, what are the proposed amphitheater functions? Um, I, I know partly I think the thought was um, small community concerts or, you know, school concerts, things along those lines. I know initially they talked maybe graduation, having it act as a stage, you know, with chairs out in the field. Um, but that's been kind of, you know, they've kind of gone back and forth. I don't know if we've really, um, you know, solidified that, but um, it was mostly more to, you know, bring other things than athletics to the project. Yeah, I love so, that. Yep. Um, and I love the idea of environmentally re being responsible for all of that asphalt because yep. it's just a concern about tearing things down. Is there any involvement with the environmental sciences group here where the children can learn or even take their geometry out to these topographic maps, which I think is interesting. Um, I mean, it's not going to be done for another decade or two, so I'm wondering if there's anything that we can um, contribute to the curriculum. Yeah, I think absolutely. There's some opportunities. I mean, Sean and I, as soon as these things happen, whether it's the solar panels on top of the roof here or that potential project, I know there's absolutely opportunities for that, so we will definitely explore it when the time comes. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that Absolutely. when it comes up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank We've you. actually <laughs> gone in, I actually went to, oh, I've right. gone to a couple high schools and spoken and showed kids the turf fields and the, taking them through the, the drawings and, you know, walked out on the fields and shown them different things just to give them an understanding. So yeah, My daughter went to a private school. We've talked about Touchstone before, and that's what they did was took topographic maps to figure out where to put the skating rink for okay. the children to use. Okay. So. It's a very valuable lesson. Um, and are the lights on timers, I presume? Yeah, they're all, they will be all programmed. And, the, you know, the one thing is there's, there, they'll probably be a, you have to get a building permit for the lights because of their height, they're a structure. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always the chance, you know, they may require a, um, a special permit just based on the height. And um, like I said, luckily the school doesn't have a lot of neighbors, but um, you know, we have, we have a lot of neighbors in nature, though, and, and so the light yep. pollution was a yep. concern for migration yep. and all. Okay, yep. thank you. Sean? Um, the, uh, uh, around the track area, you were talking about making that a little larger than yep. it currently is. 
Would that impact the parking lot? No, no, nope. we're holding we're holding this as existing, working this way, and we actually you know push just slightly that direction. So it toward, okay. Yeah, but no, we we have to. We're holding this is all existing along the front of the bleachers, and then we kind of worked back. So it's all within the existing. Yeah, pretty areas much. Yep. Area right now, and if like last year, graduation outside was quite nice. Um, mm -hmm. Hot. And hot. Hot. But, yeah. um, <laughs> it, it feels but nice. Hotter. Uh, can, can events like that be held on it, or do you need to, you know, put, um, I don't know, wood down or something? I mean, is. It, they, if you, the chairs, they recommend not to have pointy chairs yeah. on the turf, um, you know, but kind of a normal base, you know, chair would be fine. A folding chair with like a strip is fine. Um, obviously, if you put any real structure or something on it, we'd recommend you put plywood or something to protect it. So yeah, so it would just take some planning rather than right, just, right. Okay. <clears throat> but people do their graduations on them all the time. Joe, yeah. no? uh, thank you, Ken. I want to move the microphone. <laughs> no. Yeah, come on. Uh, you can go back. I can shift this. Oh, but stay on that slide. I have a question. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Kathy, for the uh, presentation, and uh, I like the history of it, and I didn't realize we were, we were back that far yeah. <laughs> in 2013, but I remember being at a capital subcommittee planning meeting when the boosters came to make the first proposal, I right, believe. Right. Um, while you're on this, um, this slide, mm -hmm. because as I understand, you will be making a presentation at the Northborough Town Meeting and the Southborough Town Meeting, correct? Okay. Yes. But that is only for informational only. It's just an introduction, but you'll be taking questions from audience members, correct? Correct. People that will be there. So, okay. <laughs> the, for it will be the easy ones, right? Okay. So my question is, on this one, my suggestion is, because you may get some questions that people may say, what does our existing field look like? This is the new field. Right. So I didn't know if there could be like an overlay oh, or yeah. something. Yeah, and have, more than yeah. even that, I mean, you're going to have yeah, to predict it high, larger. Yep, okay, yep, we could add that to the... To That's the, just a suggestion. Yep. No, perfect. Yep, no, it's a good one. Because I would like to see how far out we're going, and <clears throat> I know the contour over here going to the refreshment stand comes down a little bit, so we're going to have to fill yep. that area up. Right, and we, we have to because a lot of your areas up there really aren't ADA compliant, so right. when our design, they, they will be, they have to be. Whenever you upgrade, then mm -hmm. you know you're fine because you're not doing anything. But right. once you start improving, um, then you need to. Everything will be ADA. In fact, I think we have a small retaining wall proposed right here just to make sure the grades work and such and tie into the walkway. And I think I agree with you on the track because I think we've had a lot of presentations from the facilities manager here, along with Mr. Uh, Bevan, is about the track and we've been patching it. The mm -hmm. best that we can through the ages. So I think right. it, it's also a safety issue because I think that's some of the questions people are going to say is it a need, is it a necessity, is it a safety issue? Right. And the voters of both towns have always supported anything that is for the safety of the students and visitors, anybody who is, you know, attending events here. Um, also, have we checked? I mean, what about the butters and different things that happen in town, big projects? Are there any abutters that would have to be notified on the size of this project? Um, the only abutters I think would be to the to the I think it's just up in this the corner to the track. I think that's the nearest houses, and that would only be if we need a special permit. Um, if it's, if the building for it really depends on um, the lighting regulations and such. But um, that's and, it. And the, yep, that's it. Okay. Um, and also, when you mentioned the schedule was going to be four, if four months, that's if we did everything, okay? When would that occur so that it doesn't affect any of the sports? Well, our plan, our, we always plan to get out there as soon as the school, like early June, as soon as graduation or as soon as we can have access, whether it's one field or two field, you know, whether it's the, you know, if we're doing it all together, whether we can get on this field first, this field first, you know, they'll try to do them simultaneous, but you know, if this one's being used for graduation and we can get on this one earlier, we would start it. But it would be early June and the hope to finish, you know, by mid-September, you know, October. And it could impact, 
you know, we always have to have a plan B in case, you know, you have a bad summer or something, weather, you know, we can't predict the weather, you we know, things New like England. that. Almost no, I know. Change. No, but we've had some great summers and well, you, yeah. last summer wasn't such a good summer, but it, we only had one job that went a little long last summer. But. So if it goes into like mid-September, that would affect <clears throat> practicing fields, right? But we'd have to reach out then to the towns of Southboro and Northboro and work to them as we always do mm -hmm. on the fields for, so it would not impact any of the sports. Correct. My last question um, was on the was about the ADA um, access and compliance, especially on the press box. So what are, you have ADA access, what new things are we going to have to do to bring it up to the standards? Up to well, the bleachers will be all new and um, your bleachers right now don't have like a handicap ramp which we are required to have that gets you, there's actually handicap seating in the front of the bleachers. Um, our walkways will be ADA. And what it is, the ADA, what's compliant is you have the press box which sits on top of the bleachers, you know, it sits at the top. Mm -hmm. You have to provide access to that to someone who's handicapped. So this is actually a lift for a wheelchair. It's, a, it's just a small, it's, a, it's not as elaborate as an elevator, but it's a glass and clay encased you know, type chair facility. It's just got a little metal um, pallet and they just go in and go up and, and then they go, they'll come right up and go directly into the press box. Okay, so we're gonna have the ramps, on, is it just on one side? It can, you only need it on one side one. and it worked okay. best on that side based on the grades, so. And then what would be the seating for wheelchairs? What is, is it just a larger area? It's just area? a larger area, kind of like a cutout of like the bleachers. Like you see in an auditorium? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yep. why? Okay, and that um, elevator, how do we take care of it during the winter time? You can, you know, close it off. I mean, it's in, it, has a, it has a roof, mm -hmm. um, so really it's, it's just a... It's a little harsh winter, so I was thinking. Yeah, it's, they're, they're, they're pretty self-sustainable. Yep, it's okay. just an enclosed, like I said, enclosed structure that, you know, just big enough for a wheelchair, but, you know, has, usually has clear sides, you know, kind of like windows you can see. Mm -hmm. um, as you go up, but okay. there, are, there, are, there are numerous places. Um, I've done one at Tantasco, we did at Triton. Um, we've done them numerous times, and they work with the bleacher suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they do it all the time, so. Okay, well, I look forward to another presentation, okay. two of them, at Northboro Town Meeting and Southboro right. Town Meeting. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. It's a great presentation. Oh, uh, this you. is a long time coming, um, mm -hmm. and, and Joan is exactly right. There's going to be, at town meetings, it's going to be, uh, there are wants and needs. Do, we, do we, we want this? Yeah. Do we need it? So the safety factor is going to be um, key and, yeah. and important. And clearly, I think that's, you know, the track has, has been a safety issue for some time. Is there a safety mm -hmm. issue with the field itself? Um, there can be because it's, it's very rough the existing fields. I mean, they've been over they've been used mm -hmm. You know as a grass field grass fields, you know, like anything else they, they need they usually get redone or they're supposed to get rested mm -hmm. I don't know a high school in you know in the state that rests their their grass fields if they don't have a turf field mm -hmm. so um, They just you know, they just slowly just get overplayed Which is why you normally can't get grass to grow in the middle where everybody's at or in front of the goals mm -hmm. and because uh, it just gets that topsoil that sustains the grass just gets so compacted the grass can't grow any longer and so that's going to be you you get those questions and, yeah. and just be yeah. obviously prepared to answer those if there's a safety need clearly for the yeah. fields themselves that's going to be a key component yeah. of the discussion and then um uh you know there's also going to be questions about the safety of turf versus natural grass right do you have stats on on that we that do be able to share we, as well we okay. do you know it's you know basically the injury but we have slides i mean i can have all that at the ready um, yep i think that'll be important and then yep. um uh uh what what is so so we already know we're beyond the life of uh, the track in particular um how in, and i may have missed it what is the lifespan of of the track and the field that that you would be proposing and what kind of maintenance costs are going to be required? You mean later on, you know, once it's turf, you mean? Yes, once um, it's done, how yep. long should it last? And what kind of maintenance okay. do you think upkeep is going to be required on an annual or yep. whatnot basis? Well, the turf fields, 
usually you don't have to replace your turf. It's usually eight to ten years. Okay. Um, most schools, if it if they maintain it well, which it doesn't take a lot. All you're basically doing is um, tracking depths of the infill, um, which is like the material between mm -hmm. the blades, um, and it's just and we will test. What we do is um, as part of our spec, we put in that your turf supplier will come out for that eight years. They give you an eight year warranty on the turf, that's standard. They'll come out once a year and do what they call the GMAX testing, which is related to concussion protocol and mm -hmm. um, to test basically how soft your field is. Um, and so it's really maintaining the level of that infill, which it does migrate a little bit, especially like in front of goal areas, um, you know, because there's a lot of, mm -hmm you know, foot movement and whatever, and it gets moved that, you know, the maintenance people would come in, you really just kind of take a handful and sprinkle it in and kind mm -hmm. of rake it around. And it's nothing, you know, like that takes a lot. Um, on a grass field, your maintenance cost can run 25 to 30 grand a year. Mm -hmm. uh, turf field, you're looking at a couple thousand. Okay, so that'll be key. And also yep. obviously yep. as part of the maintenance plan, having that yep. uh, continual fund every year to make sure yep. that once this Hey, you're going to need a new turf in whatever, you know, a decade. Yeah. Okay, well, we've already been planning for that. We saved for that. It's not going to be a major hit. It won't be a hit because we plan for it. Right. Are there, is there... Um, hey, can I just make a comment please. on that too? I think one of the challenges right now is that there aren't enough fields in the communities of North Brown, South Borough for mm -hmm. youth sports organizations. Many of the youth sports organizations can't use our fields because they can't tolerate the, the use. I think one of the um, conversations that we've had is we'll have many more opportunities to actually rent our fields mm -hmm. to use sports organizations and using those rentals and those facilities fees that we would collect as a repository for ongoing maintenance like in 10 years mm -hmm. when we need to reinvest in replacing the turf as an okay. example. Perfect. Um, and last two questions, if no, I may. No so, uh, is there you you talk, discuss lighting? Is there also sound that's part of this? But there, we have not included a PA system. I mean, you can, but we have not. It's just hadn't come up with the programming. So, um, okay. I mean, it can easily be done. Um, I guess, it, um, and I always think that's a major part of the you know the announcers and whatnot. And, yep. and uh, so. Um, uh, seating would be uh, only on one side, or would there's seating be, for instance, for a visiting? It, it only fits on one only side. Only fits on one side. The way so it's so tight. Yep. Okay. And then under the field, is there anything under the field? And, and this may be cost prohibitive, but a heat source under the field for, you know, when that's required. I know that's well, something that can be done. It, it can be, but you're is talking it too much. A, a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. And the retractable roof is also <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. We did bring it up, Dan. All right. We brought it up. <laughs> On the record. Yeah, it was like we a, asked no. about the dome. <laughs> you asked. You did nice dome. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're Kathy. welcome. Um, so with these, are they pre-lined or do we have to line them as well? What do you mean? Pre are the fields pre-lined for all the different sports? Because lacrosse is different than soccer, soccer is different Yes, than that's, uh, yep. We, right now we've assumed everything's going to be what we call inlaid, which they put the lines in permanently. Okay. But as the project moves ahead, you know, and the only reason we assume that is because that we're trying to account for worst case costs. Yep. But if the school decides, all right, you know, whether it's field hockey or some sport just isn't going to get used that much, what we do is what we call tick marks, where it's very easy to go out and paint it if you wanted to paint it. And what we usually do too is make sure your contractor paints it the first time, so then you kind of have the ghost lines and it makes the painting even easier. And so, how often does that have to get done? The painting, it's usually um, a couple times a season. Again, depending, a lot of it depends on your weather. Okay. Yeah, you know, if it's wet or whatever. And when we did this, did we do anything with the baseball field? Was that ever part of it or not? We did talk. Uh, about the baseball field, but that it was cost prohibitive. Okay. And was there any conversation about using cork versus pellets? Um, the, right now we've costed out a product called Envirofill, which is a, a coated sand, but it's an environmentally friendly versus not that 
there's nothing wrong with crumb rubber. I know there's a lot of stories and things out there and semi-official studies. I don't know if it'll come up in a yeah. conversation. In a, in no, a yeah, question. which we've had this discussion with the team, and it was decided to plan it. They, you know, we call it an alternative infill, and there are some other options. And by the time this gets <coughs> built, there could be even a better option. But right now, we've assumed what we think is going to, you know, they cost more. The, the crumb rubber is the cheapest way to go, but um, they decided we go with the added cost and make sure that we are using a product that's and not going to And does that last just as long as the? Yes. It does? Yep. The parents don't have to come home to like those pellets everywhere. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> the cork and those, those you do have to replenish yeah, more. Yeah. They do break down. They're organics, you know, they eventually break down. And they can so. plow these fields too, correct? Yes, they can. Okay. Yeah. Huh? I just wanted, uh, since the baseball and softball fields came up, are, uh, are those in good shape? I mean, are, are, is that another thing we need to start looking at? Are they within 10 years? Or what, you know, I mean, are we seeing any issues with those? I don't think anything's been reported. Sean, has anything been reported? Yeah, I've, no, I've never heard, heard that. I, don't, I just don't think they get the same volume of yeah. just like foot, literal foot traffic. Sure. So I, I think, uh, you know, the baseball field looks like it's in great shape. And I think that's true of the other... You have first hand baseball. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball and yeah. softball fields. I just want to make sure we're doing our due yeah. diligence and not. No, that's a yeah. very good um, question. Leaning I, towards I, share, I had a conversation a couple of hours ago at the baseball field with Mike Mazzarino, and he mm -hmm. said it's one of the better ones yeah. mm -hmm. we typically play on. So. Right. Okay. I mean, the only hard part about those, like, we've had so many seasons where the kids have tried on, on, the, on the parking lot, yeah. right? Yes. And then they've gone to, um, what's the center? Over oh, in. Yeah. Uh, in Northboro. Yeah. 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 I think the name of it. Any BC. No, the one thirty five. Yeah, by yeah. way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know if, if we go back and, and like, over by, uh, do we wings. share, the, like, that? Yeah. Do we share our field yeah. with them for cost purposes if we have to go use those? Hmm. Do we know? We do. We do, we do know. pay for those. Yeah. Okay. But I think the other, the other um, challenge with a grass field in spring in New England is just gaining access. And if you have a mild right. winter, you can get on the like field fairly fine, easily. Right. But one of the things a, a second turf field would afford, yeah. softball, baseball, they can practice on those mm -hmm. fields. Okay. Did you have a question? I, do, I, I have a couple of questions, actually. So I want to acknowledge that Coach Pachetto is in the audience. Um, <laughs> he's the yeah, uh, track coach here at Algonquin. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions. You mentioned uh, electricity in the infield. Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to be in, what sort of locations is that going to be in? Is it going to be fairly well distributed so that it can be readily accessed, for example, by... There's two, two spots located. If you go back to the schematic design for the stadium, um, we basically do it at the 50-yard line. It's on the electrical, but we basically do it back here and, and up at the same spot on the other side. So you could plug in something, but there's nothing through the field. I try not to put anything in the middle of the field. All right. Um, another question would be, was there any, right now, the difference between the JV field and the uh, upper varsity field, it's almost like a two-tiered uh, topography okay. between those. Is, was there any, I think I know the answer to this, but was there any uh, consideration given to making those two fields uh, level with each other? Um, no. I, I think That is we, the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... we, we. Right, and I, I would assume that would be very cost prohibitive from a drainage yeah. standpoint. Um, with the bleachers being replaced, um, was any consideration given to expanding to an eight lane track instead of a six lane track to um, make us more attractive, for example, for hosting district events? Yeah, it just, it, it just didn't fit and based on the constraints that we, we've been working <coughs> with. So we, we did, move, that was something we it talked was, a lot it was about considered, so we could host yeah. events. And, yeah. um, Awesome. I definitely want to acknowledge, I think the notion of having rentals from youth sports organizations is really important. I mean, anything we can do going forward to offset the cost mm -hmm. of this project and offset our operating costs going forward, I think um, is, is great for the community. So thank you very much. It was a great presentation. <laughs> Kathleen? I had just a couple of follow-ups that you, you caught me about. Somebody mentioned something about concussions, and so I just looked up some of the research and it was saying that the longer an artificial turf is used, the, uh, it loses the protective characteristics um, for attenuating a drop. So I would like to recommend that we follow head injuries once this project is done, which I would hope that we were um, keeping track of them. 
Anyhow, and I think a sound system is really imperative. I agree with Dan that that um, is a necessary part, and I would imagine it's expensive. And as we talk about the tennis courts, I've said this before that I come and play tennis, and it's I, I never see any kids. It's adults in the community, and, and and I've seen it more as a town resource than a high school resource, which speaks to me of town maintenance versus the high school maintenance. Um, and if there was like a need to do the baseball courts or to stage this, then I would suggest that the tennis courts come up last, as much as I would hate tripping over the cracks myself. <laughs> but I think it's the fiscally responsible um, thing to consider. I'd just like to address, I guess the one thing I did think about the PA system, I think there's brand new speakers Correct. out there. So I yeah. don't know if there's, I, I'm, I, forgive me, I have several projects and sometimes they run together, but I do remember that there were like brand new speakers up on the light poles. And so I, I think we assumed, you know, we were just going to maintain the existing, you know, reuse the existing system. But, you know, obviously we can confirm what that is and, you know, if the school wants improvements or needs, you know, then we can obviously get one priced and put it in the in the. Is that bid. what you understand, Keith? That's correct. Okay. And when were those purchased? Not long ago. I don't know the exact. Five years ago? Five, yeah. It was a donation. Sounds great. And they're bows. They're, they're bows. Sounds great. Yeah. Reuse, yeah. yeah. And in regards to the concussion with the, um, related to the turf field, because we are proposing an alter alternative infill, we're required to put what they call a shock pad yeah. under mm -hmm. the field. This shock pad, even if your infill is not at its acceptable level, basically your field will never fail its GMAX testing because that shock pad just maintains that extra safety. Um, for the kids. Kathy, do you want me to go to that slide so yeah, you can show it? Yeah, I think degrade. that would be helpful. Although that you, you can say it degrades across time and if we're yeah. looking across eight yep. or ten years. Then yeah, this this is just kind of give you a section to a turf field for you, those of you, you have the, um, the fibers up at the top, um, which is your carpet, which is the top part. It's a carpet. It's called a carpet. Um, the next thing you see down the gray patch, that's your, your shock pad. It goes right under the turf. Um, then there's a fine stone layer um, that goes under that. that. That allows us to really grade the field flat, make sure we meet the grades. And then there's usually an 8 to 10 inch stone base. That's, that's really your drainage. That's the infiltration. That allows the water to, to get to basically go down quickly. And then any water that doesn't make it into the ground, we do kind of a grid piping system underneath. Um, a lot of it, we have main pipes, but we also do what, what they call a flat panel drain where it just looks like they squish a bunch of pipes and connect them that go in very, very low and doesn't take a lot of depth up. And then your infill, which we talked about, is this material that's within the blades of the, of the, um, the fibers. And this, you know, depending on what infill and your sports um, and such, you know, regulates how deep this is going to be. But as I said, with an alternative infill, we have to do a shock pad. They just, it does not, the alternative infills just don't provide the cushion crumb rubber does, but usually you have crumb rubber, it's, it has to be thicker. Um, within the blades, your blades have to be thicker, which doesn't always work for sports. Field hockey likes the grass short, you know, foot, soccer likes it a little, a little longer, football likes it even longer, you know, so we try to propose a, a turf that kind of try to accommodate everybody. Hey John, I had a couple of questions if you okay. don't mind. Um, <clears throat> the, the cost you mentioned was around seven and a half million, I think. Mm -hmm. And I know at one point there was a 25% contingency. Is that yep. in included in there? Yes. Yep. Okay. And a lot of that, well, one, because we're at schematic design, um, you know, that percentage drops as we finalize our design and refine, you know, what's, you know, we've solidified everything that we can. Um, but also today's market it is just kind of, um, very volatile right now between, you know, the, the war and the getting over COVID. You've got transportation issues, you know, you name it. I think everybody has seen it. So we're, we were holding higher contingencies right now to, to make sure you're covered. Also, we're talking building this a year from now. And as we all know, nothing gets cheaper. Everything gets more expensive, so. Thank you. And uh, yep. just one other thing. So you said the lifespan is eight to 10 years. So what happens after that? I mean, we're not redoing this whole thing again, right? But what kind of cost could you expect to to, to, to redo to the done? turf? It's usually about five hundred thousand to come back and redo the turf. They basically come in, take 
pick up the infill, pick up the turf. All you're replacing is that carpet. Okay. The stone, the shock pad, those are all good for like 30 years. So, you know, it's just, it's that carpet that eventually, because of sun, it deteriorates too. You know, the blades and such will, you know, it does eventually break down. But like I said, if you maintain the field well and whatever, um, you know, most fields were doing turf replacements. They're 12 to 14 years old. And it really depends on, you know, staying with it. What about the track? The track, well, um, the track, again, if it's to be maintained, um, we're proposing a latex, which is, there, you have a choice between, um, I take that back, we have a choice between latex and a urethane. We're actually proposing a urethane where it's, it's a more durable track, it lasts longer. Um, like I said, your average track will last about 18 years, and with a urethane track, you probably would have to resurface it, you know, about halfway through that. And, um, and that's, you know, keeping an eye on it, but that coming in, that's really just the top coat coming in, redoing, you know, the rubber coat, and then you restripe. And, um, you know, and that's usually just, uh, that can be like a couple hundred thousand. So. John? Um, while you have that up there, I have a question. Mm -hmm. On to the lower right corner of the track field, we have a concession stand. Yep. Has anything, we're changing so much around here, is there anything proposed in this with the concession stand or is that separate? So we started having conversations around having the concession stand at what we call, I think it's called McDonald's. Uh, yes, the McDonald's so, house. Um, <laughs> so that, that added a significant cost to the overall project, so we did not move forward with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there also needs to be some upgrades in terms of uh, restrooms and facilities mm -hmm. that are part of this uh, project. Um, but it is something we've discussed around making the concession stands more um, part of the overall um, complex. So at some point, that is a plan to move forward with that, but not with this initial not project. With this one. Okay. And then my last um, suggestion, you talked about the cost-saving measure of pulverizing mm -hmm. the tennis and putting that underneath. Are there any other cost-saving items that you see? And if you don't have them right now, I think it would yeah. be helpful for the town meetings if there would be a chart. What is the, you know, I mean, you probably noticed probably several of them off the top of your head, yeah. but I think it would be helpful for the voters and the citizens of the town to see what are some of the cost saving measures that you're doing, that you're instituting to save the taxpayer dollars. I think okay. a, a chart of that, and also talking about the benefits. Talking about the benefits that, you know, we're gonna be getting some income from this <clears> on the <throat> rentals, and it, again, even what Kathleen was saying, concussions on these students, that by putting in the track field, we're helping to protect the students, you know, on. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. But we have the shock pad, don't you think? But the, well, with the study, I read a white paper, and it said that the shock pad will just compound, you know, like your kitchen sponge starts out kind of fluffy, and then it just goes down with use, and that's what they were talking about, that it's the head that absorbs the impact, oh, okay. and not the ground. Okay. We're, so, we're, the, the fields are required to meet a certain GMAX level, mm -hmm. and as far as we know, we've never, with the shock pad, we've never Ex, you know, been below the level that we're supposed to, to meet. But, you know, a, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, it's like anything, but. It is yeah. a great point. I mean, yeah. the, you know, when that, when it's cold out there and that, and the current field dirt. is just Ice. dirt, it's just yeah. concrete, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I think, you know, it'd be good to do that analysis to see what kind of, because those questions, these are good questions that will come up. Yeah. And, and again, safety is, is, is key. Um, yeah. Uh, it, part of that is, uh, you know, that and Joan brought up uh, the concession stand, which I usually, in my mind, I see it. It's in the corner. It's often dark. Um, if, if with the lighting being zeroing in on the field, there is going to be lighting mm -hmm. around for safety and for where people are walking and the concession. So that's all built in is additional lighting. Yes, we've got walkway lighting. Um, if you go to the schematic, um, maybe. Well, this one is, well, the house is, this is the McDonald's house. We've got this walkway. We've mm -hmm. got proposed lighting for that. We've increased lighting in here. And then you go to the back to the other one. It's, um, we have, we have lighting, um, you know, this, this walkway won't need it per se, but back in here we'll have, we've got lighting proposed as well. 
That's good because uh, mm. kids seem to find their way there. So yeah, uh, yeah, find those pictures or whatever. Yeah, thank you. Yep. So can I just um, add a, one comment, and that is, there really is not an option to do nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not, it's fine as it is. No investment needs to be made. The question really is, what type of investment does do the communities want to make um, to make it safe? and to make it for uh, future athletes, you know, not just five years from now, but 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years from now. So that's really the question. If you look at our capital plan, there is um, expenditures in our capital plan to fix some of these uh, problematic areas on our, on our you know, tennis courts, um, the track, and so forth. Do we have any use information on them that would respond also to town inquiries? You know, um, a study of a week's worth of use now that it's spring of the tennis courts, or how many students are involved as individuals in whatever sport, however many times, and then however, you know, then that aggregate number, that bigger number. But, you know, what percentage is it of the whole student population that are utilizing? seven million dollars worth of, of revenues yeah I mean I think PE uses these facilities every day yeah <laughs> you know. I, I've never seen a use and, um, um, survey and I, I would find that useful you know I think uh, Mike Mosserino keeps partic athletic participation so I think that is excellent data I think um, you know those are the types of um, data sets that we'll need to capture and provide and communicate yeah I'd like to see a set of those I don't know if others would but I know I just, there's tons of kids out there all the time. I mean, every day you can't park, you, you know, there's, there's so many different sports going on and, and uh, all the parents that come, the friends, the students who watch others, you know, play there. It is really a neat thing to see in the afternoons here. There must be a schedule somewhere that shows who's using the field at what time. So Yeah, yeah I don't think, and no one's out there with a, with a you know, you know, counting kids, but it, it's a significant. Yeah. Seen other, it's great actually to see, and it is a tremendous community asset for mm -hmm. both towns, right. you know. And if you have a really nice track, people are going to be walking the track on the weekends. If you have nice tennis court, I mean, it, it, it is a community asset, and I think people's mindsets around using it I think will change um, when it becomes the facility that we feel it really mm -hmm. should be. Yeah. brings up the point of who pays for a community asset. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I brought this up with my sons who both went through here and they're kind of, kind of that debate about Northboro, Southboro, who's using it. And they both said, I, I played tennis here with a lot of my friends from Southboro, but I also, and if I couldn't find a court here, I'd go, I can't remember where they are in Southboro, but there's a attached to a school there. They'd often get kicked off of that one, but um, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, politely, I think. <laughs> and uh, but no, I, you know, I mean, so th th their own experiences were that they were using them with the kids they meet here um, mm -hmm. in both places. Mm -hmm. But um, the only other data point or a question I would have is, if we were to use this a lot, and we might not be able to answer this, um, how much opportunity uh, would there be for rental? you know, with games going on and so on, and what is, um, can we even make a projection on like a yearly income that we might, you know, shoot for or something? I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of Until comparable you communities. There, you, you, know, you don't know what the demand's gonna be, but yeah. But the surrounding communities do, you know, they rent the they facilities, rent. and okay. I think we probably can get comparable data yeah. um, to see how much they actually receive in rental. I'd imagine it's significant. Mm. Even to connect with the recreation <coughs> departments of each community and start up, make, you know, there's all this money now being spent on pickleball that, you know, to make tennis fun again somehow. Yeah. John? Last one. I you promise. promise. <laughs> I promise. Um, because at um, the both town meetings, we always uh, have hard copies of our budgets that we pass out. Could there be a condensed version? of this, maybe not with all the photographs because of the printing cost and paper, but even just something so simple like this for those people that, you know, maybe have a hard time seeing it, 
uh, you know, from their seats. QR code it. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Do what? Uh, QR, QR code. Use a QR, QR code oh. where people can just pull it up on the PDF. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that'd be a good idea. I do. If it condense it down, I would think. That's it. I just have one more comment. And that is, I know so many students who are going to be so disappointed that they're not going to get to play on those fields. Um, so it's, it's awesome and it's great. And, you know, I look forward to it. And I will say that, you know, we have invested a lot of money into our schools and our curriculum and our technology. And, you know, it's time for this. And so I hope that the community you know, and I think our students will share in that um, excitement and hopefully bring about that, that voice too, um, so. Good. Yeah, um, my final question actually is for you, Greg, and that would be in terms of figuring out whether we're gonna do phase one or phase two or for phase three or a combination thereof or all phases, is this gonna be based on feedback from town meeting is it going to be based on a decision that we as the school committee make like we're going to move forward with this phase but not this phase what exactly does that look like uh, going forward yeah so i think that it's an excellent question and leads into really the next topic which is really um creating an athletic complex project committee to really um garner community support to educate um, and to help make some of those decisions if it were my decision, it would be to move forward with all three phases. Many of the superintendents that have phase projects implement phase one, and then almost impossible to move to phase two and three. So that would be my preferred uh, model, but obviously this is a significant investment for the community and taxpayers and the citizens. So um, establishing at the Athletic Complex Project Committee their purpose and their goal would be to garner that support, to educate, um, and to really communicate the why. Why is this needed? Safety, um, an investment in our students, and so forth. So that's my quick answer. <coughs> Sean? Hey, uh, the boosters, I know, have talked in about this uh, a lot. So obviously, they would be part of that committee. Not obviously, they would, they would be part of that committee, and then any fundraising, you know, we redid a lot of policies and things to, you know, the committee would look at fundraising efforts or something to offset. Yeah, so the proposal, so it probably um, would be the will of the committee to make a motion. So in your packet, I did include um, an outline of the Athletic Complex Project Committee and its charge. Um, so I'll read through it. So the yeah, Algon. Just before we get in, I understand we have the track coach here, and I know you had a question earlier. Normally, this is a meeting. Mr. Cavino came up to me and I gave him my question. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I just want to make sure you were covered. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just read through the um, project committee. So the Algonquin Regional High School Athletic Complex Project Committee's charge is to communicate and gain funding support for the ARHS Athletic Complex Project. The committee will be responsible for establishing a project timeline and implementation plan, presenting a project timeline and implementation plan to the North Pro South Pro Regional School Committee for a vote, communicating the scope and purpose of the project to the town members of North Pro and South Pro, including creating key documents and communications, for example, frequently asked questions, holding community forums, presenting to the town's key boards and committees, seeking support from the town's key boards, committees, and citizens, and drafting warrant articles to place on the appropriate annual town meeting warrants. And then in terms of membership, um, the local chief executive officer are designees from the towns, two school committee members, superintendent of schools, school principal, athletic director, assistant superintendent of operations, director of finance, director of facilities, two community members um, with architecture, engineering, and construction experience, two uh, booster representatives, and two Northboro South Southboro Musical Association members, and two student representatives would be serving on the committee. Dan? Will that committee have access to legal counsel in terms of drafting warrants, because that is a precise Correct. Uh, art. Okay. Correct. And, and Becky Pellegrino would take um, the lead role on nice. moving that forward with 
the debt exclusion or however it's funded, it, um, and it is complex, but yes. Perfect. And is this going to town meeting this year? Mm -hmm. so, so in terms of the where we are today, so the idea was to make sure we had excellent <coughs> schematic designs and a good cost proposal. Um, as Joan mentioned, this presentation will take place at both town meetings in Northboro and Southboro, informational. We'll establish the committee and then set a, a timeline for moving forward with a goal of bringing it to um, a town meeting and eventually a vote um, for the citizens of North and South Park within the next year. Good. Are, are you requesting, um, are you suggesting that we take a vote to establish this committee tonight? Therefore, I would like to make a motion that the Northwest Upper Regional School Committee uh, formulates a uh, Algonquin Regional High School Athletic Complex Project Committee consisting of the members uh, that were mentioned uh, by uh, Superintendent Martineau, and it is on the printed page. Second. Moved by Joan, second by Dan. Um, I have a question or a suggestion maybe. I wonder if we should have someone from advisory from each of the towns on this mm. committee. <clears throat> I don't know if that's common practice or not, but if there's any reason not to. <laughs> we can add. Dan, do you have any thoughts on that? Having so I think that is actually, that's, you're right, Paul. I think that's a great idea because you want their buy-in early because um, it's often, I know it's advisory and the, and the board of selectmen, and so we'll see. They, they are in sync. That goes a long way. That's a great idea, Paul. So I will amend my motion to include the two advisory members, one from each town, Northboro and Southboro. Second that, definitely. Okay. okay. Just a question. So back to fundraising. I know the boosters had had a lot of ideas about fundraising. Would does that fall in this committee anywhere? Mm -hmm. or, or, and or so I think that we're not more operational costs. Yeah. Right? So I think it's clear we're not going to fundraise our way through this project. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, I think the, the boosters sell have, some cookies. They maybe? they have many ideas around you know trying to offset some of the smaller costs okay. uh, potentially like um, the McDonald's house and converting that concession stand those types of okay. um, events and maybe there's a wealthy benefactor in one of the two communities who. Is interested in paying for the whole project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we had talked about advertising and and um, is there a what Shrewsbury had done to raise money, mm -hmm. which didn't wouldn't offset the whole cost. But you know, anything I think anything we can explore to help offset the cost for the community yeah, would be great. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all that's still on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're just not yeah. counting I know on that. But, um, it's in so it would be covered in this uh, group by having the boosters included, so, okay. I just wanted to make sure. So there's a scoreboard, it's not highlighted, but that yeah. is there, <coughs> it's there. Yeah. That's like a perfect sponsor opportunity, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. You can put more than one advertisement yep. board, you know, panel. But a lot of times, you know, they're not, they're like 40, 50 grand, depending on what you put on them, and, you know, what they're doing, but um, yep. that's usually a big one that mm -hmm. goes. Awesome. Any more questions, comments? I believe we can just vote the amended motion, right? So, all in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you everyone. I will See you soon. Add all your suggestions. <laughs> to my Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Appreciate the input. And next item is a social emotional learning presentation. So yes, so um, <coughs> this evening we have Dr. Jennifer Lipton O'Connor, who is our coordinator of social emotional learning. Um, she is responsible for um, coordinating social emotional learning across the three districts. Um, and she has been a welcomed addition to our team and has made a gr great impact across our 10 schools. And this evening, she is here to share um, a little bit about the work and where we are in terms of um, moving forward with these initiatives. Thank you, everybody. 
many thanks for the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing this year. Um, so as Greg said, I am the Social Emotional Learning Coordinator for the district. Some of you know me though, because before that I was the school psychologist here at the high school. So I might look a familiar, like a familiar face. So I always like to start with a shared definition of what we mean by social emotional learning. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Castle Frameworks, but if you are, um, we use their definition, which is up here. And their definition of social emotional learning is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. So kind of a big definition. Um, I think it's something that as educators, we've always thought about a lot, but certainly now coming out of the last few years, it's definitely something that we're all thinking about a lot more than previous years. And just to sort of give you some background on CASEL, so when I talk about CASEL today, I'm talking about CASEL spelled C-A-S-E-L, which stands for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And I just want to make sure that people who are familiar with our special education program called CASEL, that they're two different programs. Mm -hmm. So today I'll be talking about the collaborative. Um, so the CASEL Collaborative is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to help public schools bring social emotional learning programs based on um, evidence-based programming into your schools. So they really do a lot of work to support the work in schools. So it's not its own curriculum that schools adopt, it's really a framework to help schools do this work. So here's what the CASEL frameworks look like. So this is one of their sort of um, classic images. And you can see they talk about five core competencies for social emotional learning. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So if you think about these areas, you can probably think about a lot of the skills that you use throughout your, your day, maybe the children in your life use. We can think about these skills from a developmental lens. So if we think about you know, relationship skills, what that looks like for our incoming freshmen might be very different from our, you know, our seniors, our 22-year-olds, et cetera. So you can also see that the graphic here talks about you know, our instruction, our SEL instruction within our classrooms, but then it expands out, right? So it expands out to our entire school community, our partnerships with families, and then our partnerships with the greater community. So this is the framework that we are starting to use, some of the language that we're starting to use during um, the school day. So I just want to point out a lot of you are familiar with, of course, our district goals, our school improvement plan, our portrait of a graduate. So all of these things talk about social emotional learning as a priority. And I think it was your, one of your last meetings where we talked about the equity audit. And there's definitely, to me, um, social emotional learning and thinking about equity are really very linked together. It's really hard to talk about one and not talk about the other. Mm -hmm. And I think it was recommendation number two from the equity audit that really said um, social emotional learning programming was a priority coming out of that work. And I think just to remind you, we talk a lot about healthy and balanced learners. So these are some of the action steps that we've been working on this school year. So I'll talk about those in a little more detail. So I just want to share too, I think one of the last times I presented last year, I did talk about a lot of the staff that we have here at the high school to support social emotional learning. And I want to start out by saying it's really all of us, right? From Sean down to our custodians, our bus drivers. It's really, it starts with that, you know, start with hello, right? We want to start with greeting our students, getting to know our students, making those connections. And it's really everybody in the building. But we do have people who are really dedicated just to this work, and those people include here at the high school, we have four adjustment counselors, we have eight guidance counselors, 
We have several school psychologists, a couple BCBAs. Our nurses, when they're not just dealing with COVID, are a really big part of our support staff. And then, of course, our coaches, ESPs, office staff, really everybody here, every adult here, um, is part of that team that supports our students. So some of the work this year has included, you know, sharing out that CASEL model formally to all of our schools. That's something that some staff had, some teachers are already familiar with, but some of that language is new to some people. So a big part of the work this year is really sharing out so we're all using the same language. We've also had a lot of professional development opportunities to work together, to work on some of these um, skills, to try to work together to see what our students need and how we can fulfill those needs. We've been working on what we're already doing that works and try to build on those programs. And I'm going to talk about in more detail in a moment some of our data collection methods because we really want to make sure that we're um, making decisions based on, on data. So one of the things I wanted to share with you today um, is a project that we've done across all the schools, um, but we actually started here in Algonquin, so as with many things, we're trailblazers here at the high school. So um, some of you who have children here did hopefully um, read this email from Mr. Bevan that I think we, when was it? February, March, I can't, it's all the blur now. I think it was the end of February, early March. Um, we rolled out a social emotional universal screener. So the idea is we have a lot of data collection systems for a lot of areas. We don't have a universal screener yet for social emotional learning, right? So I think this year especially, there's a feeling, there's a sense from teachers that students are struggling, right? We're worried about our students. We know we have many students who have a lot of anxiety coming out of the pandemic. We're not sure, you know, where we need to start with students in terms of their support. There's some research coming out um, that students are looking like they have symptoms of PTSD after this pandemic. We're seeing a lot more students with symptoms of anxiety and depression, social isolation. But it's really hard for us to know really a starting point here in Algonquin, right? How do we support our students here? So the idea of a social emotional screener is just like a lot of our other screeners. It's meant to be sort of a quick and easy way to screen a large number of students and it helps us do really two things. One is to get just baseline data. Right? What are the trends? Where do our, where do we, how do students look generally? Um, are there differences across grades? Are there differences across some of the areas within the screener? So getting those big trends. And then also potentially being able to identify individual students who may need some additional support, which might look like a variety of things. So this screener, we've asked teachers to, to do it. We've actually just had them completed and we've just been starting to analyze the data. Um, and it's been pretty exciting so far. So now we have multiple sources of data that we can use to help support our students. So now we have this new screener. We also have the Metro West Health Foundation survey. So we've just been getting those results back from our, um, when it was conducted this fall. We did something called the ESPER, which is a state mandated screening for, um, we did it on 10th graders, you pick one grade and it's a substance use screening. So it actually stands for <coughs> okay, screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment. That's what the ESPER stands for. So it's kind of a script that we go through. We literally screened every 10th grader um, and you, we, refer out any students who potentially might need additional support around substance use. So that we had already completed this winter. Um, of course, we had the results from the equity audit, which gave us a lot of additional information about our SEL work. And then, you know, of course, other sources of data that we've always used to make decisions, things like attendance, grades, discipline referral, MCAS scores, all of those pieces of data. 
So we're really excited about the opportunity now to really look at this data and really make some um, programming decisions for what works best for our students and what really the need is here in our school. So some of the other areas of work continue to be things like, you know, just meeting the needs of our students and families where they are. We know students have had a variety of experiences over the last two years. Kids, some kids were fully remote, some kids um, were here four days a week. Everybody had different situations outside of school. So we're really trying to just meet students and families where they are right now. And we do know that there are a lot of students with, with anxiety, social isolation. We've seen more school avoidance the last few years. So those are always things we're working on as a team. Um, things like equity and inclusion are always important pieces when we think about social emotional learning. As I said, we've had a lot of PD opportunities recently in the March PD. We just had several things including a mindfulness initiative, executive functioning, we had a mental health first aid um, training. So we've had several things really focusing on social emotional learning. And then of course we're always working with our community partners and agencies. So um, just to wrap it up, I, I think it's really important. I always go back to the superintendent's sort of theme of the year, which is the connections. And I always think, you know, when we're talking about teenagers, especially right now, thinking about resiliency and connections, to me, those two things really go nicely together. And really, you know, remembering those, you know, nurturing adults, those relationships with adults are, I think, more important now than mm -hmm. ever. Um, so I'll stop there. I appreciate the time sharing some of this work with you all tonight, and I'm happy to take any questions. Kathleen. I love that. Um, well, first off, thank you for the presentation. This is such a, a critical topic. It's my understanding that there's been one suicide at my college this semester and two last semester when I was on sabbatical. So the choices that people make, um, are a concern and the roots are here and I love that it's ubiquitously being developed from your nurses and custodians because there is a lot of contact with all of those folks and I'm wondering what your favorite book is on this topic these days so school committee members who'd be interested and also since we're not available or haven't been invited for the professional development sessions that we too could participate and be mindful about mindfulness only pick one book no can I send a few I, okay yeah would you can please I share a few yeah I would yeah. love okay. that absolutely yeah let me think about that can okay. I share it after today yes please okay. <laughs> I aim to have lunch with you okay. <laughs> okay. okay so are you um I know you said like working with community partners um I'm assuming you have a good working relationship with both the South Florida North Florida Youth Family and Services I do, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. You guys? I do. Okay. And I actually, I should say, I am on the Youth Commission here in Northborough as well because I am a resident of Northborough. So, but I also work with the Southborough Youth Commission as well, Southborough Youth and Family. So I am pretty closely connected with them. Okay. So I, I know that um, I have a lot of contact with Southborough Youth Family Services. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm on a committee that we gave a grant to them to help them with counseling outside that they can't, parents can't get right away. Yes. Um, and I just wondered if you were working with them. With Are you talking about the interface program? The interface, yeah. Do you guys work with them? Yes. So should I just take a minute sharing what the interface is? So interface is a referral service that each of the two towns actually pay into. So then families who live in each town or actually employees of either town can use this referral service. So you call the referral service and they connect you with a mental health provider that takes your insurance and has like the specialty that you're looking for. Has that been helpful for you? It has been helpful. I think North World, they just shared the data and I think they had about 40 families get connected through the interface in the last like four or five months, months which is great. There's still a shortage of mental health providers in the world. It's like a worldwide shortage. So families are still having to wait at times despite the interface referral. Southboro Youth and Family is um, able to provide like a bridge often 
with when the when the family's able to get the referral. Um, right now, Northborough is not able to, to do that bridge, so there is a little bit of a difference across the two towns, and Mary Ellen Duggan and I talk about that a lot, and working, working on some of those those challenges as well. Yeah, they just go through the anxiety, you know, when you're sitting doing surveys with kids. I mean, the past two years have been really hard. So I know Sarah herself has been, you know, yeah, having a lot of stuff going on with that. Yeah, stuff. yeah. We work together pretty closely. Okay. Chris? Thanks. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay. I think it's great um, to see what is going on, especially not only front facing, but behind the scenes in terms of what's going on and dealing with these mental health challenges that a lot of our students, I believe, are facing. I just have a couple of questions. Um, one of them would be, um, for example, with the SBIRT um, yep. survey, uh, where exactly does that information go? Are parents notified, if, for example, if a student is screened and they're identified that they are either at high risk or are, in fact, mm -hmm. abusing some kind of uh, illicit substance, um, are the parents notified as part of that process? Unfortunately, the state mandate is that unless it's an immediate safety concern, we actually are not allowed to share that information directly with the families. Okay. Um, is, this, is the student brought in to be counseled about those types of uh, yes. concerns? So they are yes. made aware that they were identified as being at risk for, or and either at risk. the identification is that students admit. Oh, so yes, yeah. so students are just asked, you okay. know, how many days in the last year have you used alcohol? How many days have you used marijuana? Those kind of questions. So students are literally giving us the answer. So then there's the follow up like conversation. So, um, students. so sometimes there might be more that comes of it. Often the kids who admit it were already kids that we were working with. So yeah. Uh, excellent. And other question would be. Um, the SEL screener, I remember reading uh, Mr. Bevan's email back in, the, um, in March, I believe it was, and my question re related to that is, in terms of, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how it's structured. As a teacher myself, I filled out, uh, for example, BASC it's, forms. Mm -hmm. So is every single teacher filling out a screening form similar to that, or is it more along the lines of, hey, listen, I have the student in my classroom, I'm noticing some strange behaviors, can you please, you know, maybe talk to the student yeah. kind of thing. Is it more of a formal, you know, yeah. is it a studies-based psychological screener or is it more of a, a teacher's intuition, if you will, of, hey, I think there's something going on with the student? Good question. Um, it's kind of in the middle. So um, it is a screener. It was shared in the email. So parents were actually able to see the exact tool. So it, lit, it asks a series of questions. About, it's about 19 questions that it asks teachers to rate on a Likert scale. So one of the questions is ability to cooperate with peers. Never, sometimes, often, almost always. And we, there's definitions for the two extremes and then teachers have to interpret like, the middle. So there is um, a judgment that the teacher has to give, but it's based on a behavioral definition. So it's not like the BASC in that there's 200 questions that are pretty, some of them are pretty subjective, and that is meant to be diagnostic. This is not diagnostic, it's a screener, and it's really meant for teachers to raise students based on what the teacher sees when the student's in front of them. So we're not, at, we didn't ask teachers to make assumptions on what students are like outside of the classroom, um, but we know that there's some limitations to it, right? We've talked a lot about that, right, Mr. Bevan? We've talked a lot with the teachers, and I think especially when we're talking about high school students, they're with seven different teachers, right? They may look different across those seven periods in the day. So we realize that, and in the future, we're gonna look at whether it makes sense to have more than one teacher rate a student. For this first pass, we felt like getting data was really important given the pandemic, given where we are with our students and you know the work that we think we need to do. So right now, each student had one teacher rate them. So it was kind of a semi-randomized thing. So you might happen to have had a teacher rate you of a class that you, your chemistry teacher rate. Yes. 
you might rate, if I asked you to rate students, you might have some kids who hate chemistry. No offense, I don't know why anyone. No, why would anybody hate chemistry? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you might just happen to, you know, the 20 kids you rated, maybe a few of them really right. hate your class, or maybe your class is first period and that kid hates the more. You know, there could be a lot of factors. We realize that. And in the future, if we had, you know, two teachers, that could kind of wash out. But we really felt like even, you know, one teacher rating a student is a lot of data. Like, we just have been sifting through it, and it's a lot of really useful data. So, yes, two, two teachers rating a student would be great, but, you know, we felt like this was a really good entry point for, for this process. Um, so, you know, moving forward, there's also two other ways that we can use the same tool. One is to have parents fill it out about their child, um, which I think is always interesting. You know, parents can actually go and look at it. It was emailed out, and you can kind of see what, I know I did my own children, like how would they come out? I think I even wrote my husband. <laughs> um, I think in one of the trial ones, I was rating all the principals here, right? Because then I had you on there. Yeah. Um, so, it is something that, you know, you can go and look and see what, so I don't think there's a lot of surprises that necessarily came out of it. And, you know, teachers know that the student, they, they're students pretty well, right? They see them every, every day. So, again, this is a good starting point. Could we collect, you know, could we have seven teachers rate each student? That'd be amazing, but that's a lot to ask of the teachers. So we felt like this was a balance of what's reasonable for teachers <coughs> and to give us some good data, right? So, Thank yeah. you so much. Is that helpful? Okay. Oh, it's great, very helpful. I think um, the reflective nature of that process is uh, super important, and it, um, <coughs> I think it's great that the district is able to support the students in any way they can, and they're trying to, you know, you're trying to identify students that are having these, these issues, because these issues are real. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, so, so you listed a lot of ways that you're collecting data. One of them was the Metro West survey. Yes. Is that the like the ones the students do themselves Correct. that then compares them to other? Correct. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know if in the past that's been shared with us. I like data, and I like to, you know I, it would be when you're talking about moving forward and developing goals. It would be interesting to see how students are rating themselves now and how they're uh, comparing to other communities. Um, so I don't know if that's something we could see in the future. Um, so we know as a, as a group where the students are rating themselves and, and what areas are concerned. And, and then to that, what are, you talked about gathering all that data to make goals for next year. Now you, maybe you haven't made goals, but are there things that are standing out that, <coughs> that um, you know, you're, you're thinking about um, the high school working on as you know focus areas. Yes, and I'll just <coughs> sure respond to that, Jen, yeah. while I, um, you're <coughs> getting prepared for that. But the uh, the preliminary data from the Metro West Health <laughs> Survey uh, just came in about two weeks ago. But oh, that's so like okay. the very fresh. fresh. Yeah. Uh, but the initial review of the data, we are going to get a much much deeper okay. um, data set from them. But the initial kind of trend lines are starting to emerge and we are starting to become aware of them and not surprisingly they are starting to show that the mental health uh, challenges kids face are, mm -hmm. are are more pronounced and more exaggerated than before and having two years in a pandemic and not a lot of access to the social kind of uh, uh, independence that students are really uh, you know ordinarily afforded has put a damper on some of the other uh, activities that students might, uh, you know, teenagers might have had in the past. So I think we're going to see some really pandemic informed data come up. That's yeah. what the initial um, data seems to suggest. Um, and I, I look forward yeah, to no, bringing that forward. And, and uh, I, I'm excited to, to work with Jen on maybe kind of overlaying that data with this data because I think they are mm -hmm. the same kids and that is brought in in two different ways, but I think there's, they just provide new dimensions to our understanding of, of our kids. In, in terms of data too, um, I've brought this up in previous years and it, it came to us. Um, I think, so in all these, you know, right, it starts in the, with the self and then classroom school. One measure of school community and, and success is the vocal data from the MCAS. And, you know, so I, don't, I didn't see that in there and I, I don't know if you've, looked at that or entered that into the, the, the components. It, you know, we've, it, it was brought to us yeah. before because I think it's a good measure of, 
of the the broader circles too. We <coughs> think that asking students <laughs> that question when they've just taken MCAS is always a little. I'm always like, eh. I, I I would say though it. But I, I agree with you. It's definitely it's a, it's available a and it's it's. It's not made public, but it is available over multiple years. So I think yeah. it's a, a valuable insight into how kids are thinking yeah. at that time every year. Good point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just going back to your, your first question, if we just think about the five castle competencies, mm -hmm. um, our high school students, we're definitely seeing the two in the orange there, the self-awareness and self-management, kind of their ability to manage their emotions. Those are the two areas that we really feel like are where we need to, mm -hmm. you know, focus but what we're really also excited about is we're currently collecting the same data at the two middle schools so we're really excited to look at where the eighth graders fall on this so looking at this for the eighth the two incoming eighth grade classes and then deciding are there things that we need to do at the end of the school year now maybe even over the summer and then the beginning of the fall to get those kids ready for the high school I think that's also really exciting work for as an elementary school principal, orange is where they're at, too. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Self-management, yeah, exactly. particularly. <laughs> just to follow up to um, what Sean said, what were the two areas? Was it self-awareness? And self-management, Those yeah. two areas. Okay, thank you. And I consider myself to be fortunate because I heard your presentation last week at the Northbrook Kitty School Committee. But this is just even a different one because of the audience that we have and, and it's the regional level. Um, I know that a lot of parents have been watching our school committee meetings and they become aware of this and this is a hot topic. And what is the avenue for a parent of a high school student that would look at this and hear the presentation and say, hey, I think my student has some anxiety. My student has some social isolation that I think might be there, but I'm not really sure. What would be the avenue for the parent to then become involved and to become part of that member with, the, with you and your team? I think in terms of like getting information about this model, this, the CASEL website actually has like links for parents. So I think that is something that all parents could go on this website and look at. But I think more specifically what your question is for their student, right? Right. So, you know, normally we start with your guidance counselor. You know, that's normally here at the high school kind of like the go-to person if there's a concern. So I think most parents start with the guidance counselor. Um, if your child is on a IEP, often the special education liaison is kind of like your go-to person here. But I think too, you know, any administrator, if a parent has a specific concern, I would definitely start Personally, I would go right to my guidance counselor and share those concerns. I think that's always the That's good the first step that they should go to. Yeah, because every single high school student has a guidance counselor assigned to them. And I would add on that we made a change to the structure of the administrative team this year so that the administrators are aligned with each grade and they, uh, they cycle with the grades. So the mm -hmm. guidance counselor you have when you on board as a freshman will be the same that you have for four years as will the the administrator and the goal of that is that you build those relationships over time and that that parent can feel comfortable knowing this is the guidance counselor that's worked with my child over time and this is the administrator as well and that that team works together and those relationships you know bear fruit for when a child is struggling or the parent mm -hmm. is seeing something at home okay thank you uh, and then just as a suggestion, Greg, to your superintendent's memo that goes out every Friday, I don't know if that has been offered to the parents, that website, I mean, think because the publicity of these yeah. two meetings, three meetings will be taking place, it'd be nice to have that as a, you know, a site that the parents could go to to get more information. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And also, I think the superintendent and I had talked about doing a presentation like this for families, but then I've been doing these for the school committee, but that's still is something we're happy to look into. And I also did share this with NSPAC a couple months ago. So some families mm -hmm. have been starting to hear about some of this work, but I, I think that's a great idea too. Thank you. I just asked one question. Paul uh, Vodka couldn't be here, and I know he would ask this, so I'll talk to <laughs> You know, a big part of what we do is approve the budget, and so if there's anything, any resources that you need that you know, if, if money weren't an object that you would have asked for, but maybe didn't, anything on those. I don't know that 
field thing looks pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, unfortunately, I don't think this is an issue that money can fix necessarily. You know, I, I wish it was like as simple as, you know, we need to hire one person or we need, you know, one program. I think this is the village, right? It's going to take a village here to, to support our students. And I think we really do have great teachers here, great staff, and people really care about the students a lot. And I think it's really fine tuning where we're, we're putting our resources. And I, right now with the pandemic, I think it's just been, let's just, you know, get through and get students what they need. You know, now that it feels like we're able to kind of start thinking about more programming and proactive strategies, I'm really excited about this work so that we can really create programs that help, you know, all students who are going to need it. So I'll take all the money you want to throw at me, but uh, can I just make a couple yeah. comments and add. Yes, so please. I'll add it for you. Um, so one thing that I think is really important is talking about the relationship of students to adults and making sure that we maintain small class sizes. There's been some conversation as we've seen reduced enrollment, um, that we, we should also be reducing our faculty and staff. And I'd argue that um, reducing enrollment, it is not a time to start reducing faculty and staff because small class sizes allow teachers to really have strong connections and get to know their kids in their classes. So I would add that. I, I think just having created your position is, is a great step too. Um, yes. You know, I, I served on the South Borough K-8 for <coughs> a number of years and we get presentations and each principal would talk about social emotional learning. But you could tell at that time there wasn't really connections between the schools and you know, what's gonna happen to this kid as they yeah. go from one school to another. So it's, it's great that you're addressing that. Thank you all for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to just, sorry, build off of that comment and just say that it has been a tremendous asset to have Jennifer in this role. She's been an asset to the district previously, but in this role, I think your point, Paul, just really helping to pull things together um, and take, take everything to the next level in terms of coherence, alignment, and being able to dig deeper. Um, the SEL work, as you said, is work that has been happening and for, like, you know, across the board. Um, but this is allowing us to look more systematically. Um, and in terms of the data collection, I also would love to take the opportunity to thank the educators. Um, you know, this was a big, a new um, uh, effort on their part. And, it, and um, they did take it on with, um, uh, you know, across the board. And so a huge thank you to all the educators for participating and from everything from the collection to analysis and starting to think about where we go with that. So, and thank you for your Let's presentation. Too, yes, really uh, uh, and the administrators. <laughs> yeah, I, I do put a, a re I have a great um, appreciation for my teachers who this was a very different task for them. If you are a, you know, a chemistry teacher or a math teacher, uh, you're very well versed in how to assess a student's um, chemistry or math abilities and this was a, a different task for them. and push them out of, out of their comfort zones a bit, and they did it and trusted us, and, uh, and I think the results are, are very helpful in informing how we should proceed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And next item on the agenda is a legislative update. So just a, a brief update. We continue to move through the state budget process, so there are four areas we continue to advocate um, with our legislative delegation in North Brown, South Pro. The first three are very familiar to the committee. The first is fully, fully funding Chapter 70 in increasing minimum um, local aid from $30 per student to $100 per student. The second is fully funding Circuit Breaker, which is the special education funding mechanism. The third is fully funding regional transportation reimbursement. Um, so those are the three that are standard each year. And the new um, area of advocacy is really having the state um, fund universal free meals. Congress did um, a, the free meal um, money expired or will expire June 30th. June 30th. And the state is looking at uh, potentially funding free meals for one more year. So 
<coughs> universal free meals bill is something that we continue to advocate for. So those are the four areas of advocacy. Up is the superintendent's report to the committee. And I will turn it over to Principal Bevan. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I get on. And, and there's, a, there's only a few quick slides, so uh, if you just turn, I think you would, that would probably do it for you. Um, let's see if I'm getting on the right. Okay, here we go. Thank you. So um, we've had a lot of exciting things happening in the last few weeks, and, and I think it's just worth noting, uh, since before the pandemic, we just have not had uh, the kind of week like we had last week, where we had several really impressive things happening, where our teachers and our students um, uh, um, kind of collaborated on different different things that it all just kind of came together in one week and I just think it's uh, emblematic of, uh, of our school coming out of the pandemic and being able to do things that are a little bit more close together that are, are kind of not answering to these difficult regulations that we've all had to live with for a long time and so for example um, the ADL world of Dis difference program you maybe rem remember that from um, last year, we uh, have engaged the ADL. They uh, trained our staff in November and a small team of 30 really amazing students uh, over the course of the fall to lead uh, conversations in classrooms about a variety of topics, but especially focusing on recognizing bias and the value and benefits of diversity. So that happened on Monday. Um, our team of kids, uh, of students, went into 10th grade classes and led conversations around really tough topics. And so that happened on Monday. All 10th graders participated. Um, same week, same day, in fact, seal, the seal of biliteracy is um, an undertaking here in the Commonwealth where students who have performed well on, on the English language arts por portion of MCAS are able to, if they have a, a high degree of proficiency in another language, it doesn't have to be one we teach here in school, but typically is, they're able to test, take a test um, of their proficiency, and if they pass, both have already passed that MCAS piece and the seal of biliteracy, they can get a uh, physical seal on their transcript that demonstrates that they've achieved, achieved this nationally recognized credential. It's the only credential of its type that could go on our transcript. Uh, so that happened uh, last week. I think we had testing again this week as well. Additionally, on Thursday, we had uh, the author, Jennifer DeLeon, who's a resident uh, of Southboro, um, who published, uh, has published multiple books, but uh, she is now currently promoting um, a book called Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. It's a really wonderful title about um, the experience of a fictional uh, Latina uh, young woman in a school where she's part of the METCO program and what that that experience was, is like. Um, she spoke to our entire ninth grade on an in-school field trip on Thursday um, that was organized by our wonderful freshman English teacher team. Um, and not only did she speak about her writing and about the book itself, she ran like a, a class-wide workshop on writing with the kids. Um, and Jennifer uh, was really kind of super engaging and really wonderful. Happened to be a, a student of our assistant principal, Mr. Sudmeyer, who uh, had the, this really wonderful opportunity to, um, to, uh, to introduce her and, and talk about what she was like when she was a young person. And he indicated it's not a surprise to her him that she turned out to be a successful author because she was really an amazing uh, young person and turned out to be an amazing author. Um, that was incredibly uh, valuable and engaging work. And then uh, The Harbinger is our wonderful school newspaper. You have copies in front of you. Um, I think the adults in the room may be used to seeing the print newspaper, but we have not had one in two years. Um, and this was the first time we've had an issue of The Harbinger come out um, since before the pandemic. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of close contact with students laying out the newspaper to get it done. And so the kids got that done, and they were very, very excited to go to press with that. Just to give you an idea, most schools do not have a print newspaper. Maybe, maybe they don't have one at all. Uh, many schools do not. Um, and certainly, they don't have one uh, of the quality that we have here uh, in front of you. So uh, we're very proud of the Harbinger and their hard work. Um, and uh, after they put that out, that was on Friday. And just to give you an idea, 
when a 46 page newspaper comes out about only news about the school, it kind of interrupts the, the flow of the school day. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers I knew when I was a teacher here when the Harbinger came out and I ran the Harbinger, so I knew you just have to kind of budget the beginning of that first class for kids mm. to like kind of, they just want to see what's in there. They want to see if their photo is in there, if their friend's photos are in there, if that interview they did, if the, it's all the things we do. I'm the principal and I'm interviewed in here and I flip through to see did they, <laughs> you know, what was in there. Um, more Harbinger news, which is, uh, you know, just I, I'm kind of gushing at this point, but the Harbinger was named uh, named by the National Scholastic Press Association, which is exactly what it sounds. It's a very prestigious National Scholastic Press um, organization. Uh, they were named an online pacemaker, which we were one of just 20 online newspapers in the country to get the, awarded this designation. A hundred um, websites or hundred school news sites uh, competed or kind of submitted for judging on this. There are certainly more than 140 uh, sites in the country, but they're the ones who thought them, you know, thought their work well enough to be um, judged. Uh, and ours finished in that in that top 20. This kind of um, really strong showing. It's the second time the Harbinger has re received that designation. So we're very proud of our school newspaper. It's a real feature of our uh, of our school program. And I also think it, it really says a lot about our, how we value student voice. It's an important part of the democratic process to have a strong um, a strong press, not only in, in a school, but in, in the larger democratic process. So um, so there's a lot of Harbinger news about news, but uh, <laughs> it was just been a really wonderful last week and a half where things are starting to come together and it's really feeling like a lot of the hard work where um, people put in and where the restrictions started to lift, where we're really starting to um, pick up some inertia uh, and make it feel like school has felt um, before the pandemic. That's, that's kind of my feeling currently. Um, and then we're heading into the break at the end of this week, so we're very excited. So that, that is the, you know, the my principal's report. Question, comments, Joan? So I'm just perusing through uh, the Harbinger. I like the format. I'm used to the big news. Yeah, this is a new format. Have. They were nervous about it. It's a, called a magazine style format. It yeah. is. And you know what? It's interesting even for the students, I think even for parents to peruse this. I mean, you talk about the Alice drills, and then I like the opinion page between the pro and the con on the Alice drills, and even, you know, the news story about the, the new mascot being the Titan. I think that that's wonderful. So. It's, it's great for parents besides students. Thank yeah, and we, the, we actually offer, not we, the Harbinger as a club uh, in an effort to raise funds and help offset the cost of printing. They sell um, copies to parents who, as a donation, I think for $10, they will mail home uh, the copy that you have here. Uh, they will do that. Um, I don't know if they still do it, but in the past we've done uh, like a, a, a subscription service that parents can opt into. As teenagers not always well known for coming home and telling you all the news of school, I found when I ran the Harbinger that you could sell newspaper subscriptions to parents if only because they want to know what's going on in school in a way that their child might not report when they get home. Um, and just a suggestion, um, if you go to the eighth grade classes at Melican mm. and Trottier, I would take several copies because I think this is going to get a lot of interest of yeah. students. I mean, you talk about the clubs and the organizations, but I think this is going to get a lot of kids. If they would see this, wow, they would wait. They would want September to come pretty quick. Right. <laughs> well, we, they send them down to the middle school. They also send stacks over to the public libraries, um, and they send them to um, the superintendent's office. Um, they're very excited to get them into the hands of anybody who would like to see them because the kids are very proud of their work. But I think that's a great idea. And I'd also send them to the Senior Citizen Center uh, yeah. of mm -hmm. both towns. I think they'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. A great idea, Joe. Yeah. Okay. That concludes my report. Well, congrats to the Harbinger folks. That's on top of the, uh, was it the Columbia Press Award. Yes, right? they always have uh, do well with the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. I think they are waiting. I may be wrong about this, but they are, I think, wait, awaiting judging on on whether or not they will um, receive a medal from. Um, that is yet another prestigious organization. They're the two big ones, the Columbia, Columbia Scholastic Press Association and the National Scholastic Press Association. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So next in your packet is the enrollment report as of April 5th, 2022, uh, and no significant changes from last month. 
Also in your packet is the FY22 monthly general fund expenditure report as of March 31st, 2022. And Becky actually is on the West Coast um, this week. So um, she did send, send a memo along. So I'll quickly read where we are. It's hard to believe that we're in the last quarter of the fiscal year. Um, so they're monitoring the budget very closely and, and watching expenditures. Um, the ending balance for the month uh, ended March 31st, 2022 was $133,909.92 or 0.53% of the remaining in the FY 2022 operating budget. Compared to the same time last year, the FY 2021 operating budget had $416,476.10 or 1.73% remaining. Um, it is important to note that the March 31st, 2022 budget balance reflects an encumbrance of $400,000 that will revert to E&D at the end of fiscal year 2022. And this is to ensure that our E&D balance remains within our school committee policy of 3.25 to 3.75%. That I will entertain a motion <coughs> to approve the Northboro Southport Regional School District Fiscal 2022 Budget Monthly General Fund Expenditure Report as of March 31st, 2022 until audited. So moved. Second. Moved by Dan, seconded by Chris. Any discussion? All in favor. Is unanimous. <coughs> so also in your packet is the FY22 Statement of Revenue. Um, the statement of revenue report as of March 31st, 2022 shows overall receipts of $192,594. Uh, the district has revised its charter school tuition receipts to reflect a more accurate estimate of receipts. Uh, these funds are partial reimbursement to our district for the tuition costs incurred for students attending charter schools. It March marks the beginning of the spring athletic season and we've received fees and student activities and parking fees. Uh, the report reflects that we have received just about 75% of our anticipated revenue, which is where we would expect to see our revenues three quarters of the way through the fiscal year. So no significant um, changes from last month. I'll entertain a motion to approve the statement of revenue as of March 31st, 2022 until audited. So moved. Second. Moved by Dan, second by Chris. Discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. So, and lastly, on, on the superintendent's report, warrant article updates. So there's been some significant changes in the warrant articles. Um, the first change was that we had placed a uh, placeholder for the redundant hot water heater um, as um, capital project. When we went out to bid in, I think it was September? In September. It, the estimated projected cost was $180,000. So the cost increased 22% um, from the last time we spoke with a vendor. Um, so he did call us and give us a heads up and said that that cost, he's not even sure that that will hold. So um, after having conversations with um, Mark Purple and John Kadare was decided to hold and pull the warrant um, and move it forward again next year um, as a capital project. We had conversations with Mike Gorman. There is no immediate danger of our current hot water um, tank uh, breaking or not working, so we were confident upholding that. The second warrant article that um, we've taken off was the capital stabilization fund. So we've been going through our circuit of presenting to the financial advisory boards. And we did receive some feedback from financial advisory in Southboro that um, they'd like more information and potentially um, capital stabilization policy that would partner with the capital stabilization um, article. Um, some of their concerns are that um, there are no gate or goalposts for this capital sta stabilization uh, fund in their opinion and that if we move forward with um, a policy along with the Warren article that they could get behind it. So um, we decided since there was no funding behind it this year that it was prudent to work with the policy subcommittee and bring a policy forth to the committee, get that approved, and then 
move the capital stabilization warrant article to a fall uh, town meeting in Southboro for hopefully approval. So those are the two changes. Kathy? So is that, so if we did that, is that where we put money for the project? The field potentially. Project is potentially. Potentially. Didn't we have this conversation with them last year too though? So two years ago, or two years ago, 2018. Like, so it was in person, it was a warrant article, and it was um, not approved by the citizens citizens of Southboro um, for many of the same arguments that the capital advisory made um, this year. Um, that they felt that it just needed more goalposts in terms of what it was for, um, <coughs> how much how much could accrue in that account, and so forth. So if we have a person go who just presented to us from Gale Associates. Is that part of like a, and, and we can make a policy on this too, but will that make more of an argument for having the stabilization fund? I think that and the um, the purpose of the capital stabilization fund was to actually fund smaller capital projects oh, like okay. the redundant okay. hot water heater. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So okay. rather That's than having to go okay. to the communities and, you know, okay. All right. All right. I got you. I think of that sheet we have with the red, yellow, and green, right. and everything keeps getting the cap our capital moved right. over. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. So right. my question would be about that and about ARPA funding and the fact that we haven't really discussed it here, but I assume that's probably because we Southboro has their separate ARPA funding, and so so does Northboro. And can we make that fit anywhere within those operating you know, like the hot water a heater, because I know we've used it for Proctor. Um, so how do those discussions fit in? Yeah, so I, I do know that the town of Northboro is in the process of identifying how it will use ARPA funds. I believe um, this Thursday there was a scheduled meeting, a public hearing. It actually has been postponed till June, I believe, which is actually good. It'll give us an opportunity to actually put together an argument for um, what we think as a school committee um, okay. to fund projects in the same in Southboro. And so would we have to, for example, I don't know, say something was $200,000, we'd have to get a, you know 100000 from Southboro and 100000 from Northboro and we'd vote on it. Correct. They'd have to both yeah. agree to fund okay. it and, and how they fund it might be different depending on the yeah community. but I think that's definitely worthy to look into as far as we have this money coming to us and some of these items are coming up on this list that we really should pay attention to yeah and we you know I have many conversations with the town administrators and they do have you know capital projects and capital plans and master plans so part of the conversations have centered around what are those items on the list that have been deferred over yeah. The past couple of years, that also don't create uh, a budget shortfall once that money no longer is available to the communities. Right, and then like my other point would be like Mary Ellen was saying that they wrote some grants for some social emotional learning things, which coming out of the pandemic is is a one time thing that would be very beneficial to these programs that we just discussed. So I'd like to really kind of keep that g discussion going as we, you know talk it, about our. And also, I think we also have ESSER three funding. Right. So that is equivalent to the town ARPA funding. That is equivalent to right. the school's funding. So we also have that as, a, as a, a pool of money that we can think about some of these needs. Okay. John? All right. And just some history on this, because I say this is just going before the Southboro town meeting. Northboro town meeting has already approved a stabilization fund. Is that correct? Correct. And what year was that? 2018. 2018. <coughs> so if Southboro would request more information, would you give that same information to the town administrator of Northboro? So the, so the warrant article would remain the same, mm -hmm. and the school committee policy would drive the parameters for that capital stabilization okay. fund. So you wouldn't need to bring that. We don't have to update or anything. Okay. Thank you. No. In fact, we thought that was a simple solution to this, was to just put language in the article saying we would only spend so much per year or for projects of X amount, but because it didn't match what Northboro had already passed, the council said that wasn't a great idea, so here we are. <clears throat> so 
So, and lastly, in terms of the Warren articles, we just need a Northborough representative to um, make a motion on the town floor for the regional school committee budget. Paul, I'd offer to do that. If it's okay with the other Northborough members. Go right ahead. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're it, John. Okay. <laughs> Fighting for it. And then in yeah. Southborough, it's a consent agenda, so no one mm -hmm. needs to read it into record. Right. I think that brings us to old business and the school choice vote. Thank you. That's okay. So we discussed this at some length uh, last month, I think, right? Yeah, so my recommendation stands not to, um, is to opt out of school choice um, for a variety of reasons. Specifically, though, the $5,000 um, reimbursement received by the state um, is far less than it costs to actually educate um, the student here in Algonquin. What was that number again? It was 17K per student? Yeah, a little um, under like 18,000. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, we had chatted a little bit about what about one? Is one student going to cost 17,000 or is that student blended into generally? classes that aren't overflowing um, would there do you know would there be a cost for three or two or even one student if we did one to say that we are I mean you're the lucky one you got the one spot I mean I that, to me one is tough but is there three two or one is there a, is there a seventeen thousand dollar hit do you think on the budget for that low number of students I think it you never know. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think when you think about having a school of 1,400 students, having three additional students, and the, those three or five, a small number impacting class sizes is not going to happen. You know, I don't think it would have an impact on other students' experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think we need to look at what we're gaining um, in terms of revenue. I do look at, at, at this as a, as a financial means to actually create revenue for the district. $15,000, I'm not saying that's not a lot of money, or $25,000. Um, I'm not sure it's worth having additional students. So at what point with the, with the enrollment numbers continuing, to, like the trend is down, at what point would you say, yes, you know, we, or are you gonna lay off staff? You know, at that point, I mean, you know, what, what's the, when, when is the right time? Is there ever, do you think, might be a right time? Um, and then when I see the numbers, you know, you provide them to us every month. A student maybe is added, a couple drop. I mean, when that happens just during the school year. But we don't have a, I don't see a correlation between, hey, our budget just went up this month because, you know, we added two or three students, or we got these savings because we just dropped a few students. So, and I'm not, again, I'm not talking about 50 students, I'm talking about one, two, or three. Yeah. So I think in terms of when is the right time, um, is there a right time to start accepting school choice? I think when school communities have faced really challenging budget um, situations where they're having to lay off folks and the only way that they can sustain healthy class sizes is by accepting school choice students we have not reached that level here in Northboro Southboro it, um, I think the communities have supported the budget I think as our enrollment numbers have declined through retirements um, through people leaving there have been positions where we've not filled and we've kind of balanced the equation through attrition mm -hmm. Um, so I would say, for me, it would be when we're at a point where we're having to lay off staff and significantly increase class sizes that um, the, the committee should seriously consider school choice. Okay. Those are the questions I and possibly Mr. Budko would have had. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Most likely. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? I would just say, I mean, it was brought up last time about like if we're going to accept school choice then it is targeted so it's not at an underlying 
part of our budget it's targeted towards OPEB or capitalization stable something um, and I I think as our numbers go from yeah to, you know 1270 to 1214 or whatever if if we are not losing by attrition I think we start looking at that class sizes next year and and consider um, consider it more I mean if you know if you go down you know 50 students at 5,000 and then you know move that towards something targeted I think so that we don't have to look towards attrition also and things but um, I, I, I'd consider it more deeply next year if our numbers conti continue to drop <clears throat> and I'm not sure if Principal Bevan you have any comments that you would like to contribute yeah. Um, I would just say that I think you're right, uh, Superintendent Martino, that we keep an eye on the long game and make sure that we're, we're making our hiring decisions and our staffing decisions in mind, uh, keeping our, our projected enrollments in mind. So if somebody retires, we don't simply say, well, we'll add somebody in behind that person. If we don't anticipate that in two years, three years, that that job, that position will be still supportable by our, our, our enrollments at that time so we are always looking at that and this is a time of the year where we really closely look at that to see what do our enrollments look like so uh, we've been able to do that by attrition um, and not and not hire in behind some retirements because it wouldn't have been responsible to do so so we've been I think the phrase you used Greg was to balance the equation I think it's been that's how we've been doing it so far as to uh, <coughs> costs um, manageable by not hiring when no, it's not necessary to do so. Did Westwood participate? Um, no. Okay. Same rationale? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, we were we were in a period of growth the whole time I was there, so it just was not. We were okay. adding and adding um, just because of the, you know, the, the features of the, for whatever reason we were adding. Mm -hmm. um, 40 and 50 kids a year so it was in fact the opposite problem so okay. it really wasn't there wasn't a driver there to do that an impulse or an interest in doing so Chris I guess I would just I think I made a similar comment last year when we had the same discussion which is um, and I'll, I'll ask it as a question which you know if we were to see five thousand dollars per student um, is there any additional reimbursement for students that require additional service uh, to the district? So if a student requires uh, special education services, the reimbursement per student is $7,500. So we get a $2,500 $2, increase. Um, but if the student requires additional services, whether it's additional support from school psychologists, guidance counselors, behavior specialists, no. So it's, it's very, because it is a randomized process by lottery, it's very possible that we could accept three school choice students, receive $15,000, and one of those students could potentially need $20,000 in services. That is fair. The, the other thing I would say about school choice, sorry, can I, um, yeah. is that <clears throat> it's a choice, and so um, families that come here have to bring their students here like they have to be motivated to get here there's no bus picking them up there's no you know it's not ease and convenience so um it has to be a it should be a highly invested family that's making a choice uh to bring their child here yeah i mean i think the challenge is it's, it's you know that's i think choice i think I think that the theory of choice is outstanding. I think families should have a choice of, of educational systems. However, the funding mechanism isn't, isn't balanced to actually truly promote choice for families. Mm, yeah. And I think until that, equa you know, that equation is balanced, um, I, I see you're going to many, many communities like North Brown, South are gonna choose to hold and not participate. You, we've seen school choice experiences where students have not been successful in three or four schools and they choice into a school and it's by lottery um, and, and that student might have a significant this is one end of the continuum significant disciplinary history mm -hmm. and it's by lottery and you accept that student um, you know this other end of the continuum you might have someone who's an out you know who's an outstanding student who doesn't really need this levels of support and is um, so 
it's a it's a lottery. Um, you don't know, always know which end of the continuum you're going to need to support a student on. Or maybe an outstanding athlete who is looking for a spot on a successful team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> oh no, I was just going to make another uh, another comment in terms of um, the distinction between uh, charter school tuition and school choice, which is essentially um, for a charter school. And again, please correct me if I'm wrong. We essentially pay our full per, per, per pupil cost to charter tuition out um, in the case of a charter school, but with school choice, we would only receive uh, the amounts that have been already stipulated. Um, so it's a completely different kind of uneven uh, funding mechanism for sure. And vocational schools receive mm -hmm. even, even more per pupil mm -hmm. um, than charter schools and school mm -hmm. districts. So there needs to be some rebalancing and recalibration, I think. But. Who does that? Who not is responsible for that? No, I know you're not, but is this a state? I think it's policy at the state, just, but yeah. policy at the state level. Thank saying. you. Yeah. That sold me. Um, but I would make a motion, if I may, that we not participate in school choice this year. Second. Okay, moved by Dan, second by Karen. This is for the 2022-23 school year, correct? Correct. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? That passes unanimously. <clears throat> All right, on to the COVID-19 update. Which, uh, per Mary Allen's suggestion, we move to old business. I think last. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, if I recall, last month you were under a minute. I could be. I could even be less than that. Maybe uh, we have an uptick. <laughs> so um, our cases are rising. As you know, if you look at any of the data across the state. The wastewater data, it's all on an uptick, as are our cases at the high school. Did have a little cluster in one classroom that we consulted with the medical advisory team on. Um, we've seen clusters throughout the district in certain places, so um, that is hopefully contained right now. Um, and we're just monitoring it. We got our pool results back, and our pool positive cases are on an uptick, too. Um, for our um, absenteeism, I know that's the number we're looking at. The high school has been steady at 94, 94.1, 94.2% 94 um, since we've removed the masks. They've stayed pretty steady with their absenteeism. Um, the percent present, I guess. Right, I was going to say. Sorry, the percent <laughs> yeah. present is 94.1%, not the absenteeism. Like, um, must be a really empty school. Yeah, it's, been, it's been quiet around here. They've gotten a lot of things done. But um, the other thing that our wonderful Matt team, um, when we haven't had to focus so much on COVID and all the changes that have been going on, is that um, we are uh, putting our focus towards mental health. We have a new person who's joined us, um, Carrie O'Toole, who is a clinician in our community, um, a mental health clinician in our community. So we. Um, are thinking of doing like a panel presentation for parents to join um, hybrid and some webinars um, with different topics with the mental health focus. So Jennifer and I are working together on lots of things because we know social emotional um, well-being and health all kind of intertwine along the way. So we um, have been working side by side on a lot of projects lately. So. You know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so there are a lot of things that you'll see coming through from the school, from youth and family services, from the town. So everybody, that's the silver lining of COVID. We've had a lot more um, collaboration with all of our town resources that we have. Little over a minute, sorry, but important <laughs> things. I'll take any questions you have. Yeah. So thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, so uh, when you do your percentages, is it a weekly percentage of absenteeism? Uh, is there, it, I understand there was a weird uh, anomaly to that maybe a couple Fridays ago when there seemed to be a, a you know, exorbitant oh. number of seniors that may have <laughs> not yes, been that present. Did, do that you, do did, you drop the low and, and drop the high? That did skew or? things. That week we did not count the... Um, the Friday data. Ah, uh, okay. So, All right. So the high school has been pretty steady. They've phenomenon. been, yeah, it was an interesting anomaly. Yeah. When I looked at it, I was like, okay, what's going on over yeah. there? 
the nurses knew right away. They were like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's what today is. Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> You're welcome. Kelly. So are you finding um, with the, ki the kids who are, like, getting COVID, is it, are they, is it just a cold? Is it nothing? Is it? Do you not know, or is it, you know what I mean? Our symptoms across the board from the beginning for the past two years, our students have had fairly mild symptoms. Um, so it's still the case now? It's still the case now. Some are asymptomatic and positive, some have colds. We see a lot of flu this past week, um, which is unusual. It's a little late for flu season, but we have seen a lot of flu throughout the district. Um, so flu-like symptoms, they're, they run the whole gamut of what we're seeing. There's nothing specific. Okay. What is new is that there's new treatments, the antiviral treatments that are available for um, a, a select few that are over 12 per your primary care physician's recommendations. Anything else? Good. Thank you, Mary Ellen. All right, you're welcome. Thank you. And policy development, we have none at this time. Brings us to our second public comment. Anyone have anything to share? All right, seeing none. Oh, sorry, John. I just have an update um, as a liaison to the Northboro Ed Foundation is on their grant update, the deadline, and maybe Mr. Bevan, uh, maybe you could let the teachers know the deadline is May the 1st. And that is just a, just to do a file to intent that they're going to write something and then the application is due July 1st. So you just sent them a, at a reminder. I'll just double check that I sent that out. That I'll would be great. Check, yeah. Okay. And uh, because they've only gotten four grants in so far and just one intent to apply. So they have the money available. And Jennifer, I don't know, maybe uh, <clears throat> through that foundation, maybe you apply for a grant or something, you know, because they go, it's, it's pre K through 12th grade. Um, the other thing that's going to be happening here at Algonquin on Saturday, May 17th, is going to be the Princess Tea Party, usually for 10-year-old girls and under with their moms. Uh, the price is $15 for a child, $35 for an adult. Reservations are required. And for Teacher Appreciation Week, which is May 3rd through the 6th, uh, they're in the process of parents and uh, other community members can purchase by May 1st a golden apple for the teachers. It's $15 each or five for 50. And the bonus this year is that they're also gonna deliver a beautiful live succulent plant. Oh, wow. hmm. So, and that is the update from the Ed Foundation in Northboro. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Anything else? I just there. wanna share that I am on the fundraising committee for the PPP, the post-prom party for the juniors, <laughs> as it's known. And I just wanna say thank you to all the generous donors in the communities um, because it's amazing what the communities have been able to do. And thank you for your shout, your shout outs and your shout outs and your newsletters. Um, Cause I think it's coming together nicely. We have um, two, two post-prom parties. Yep. One wasn't enough. We're going to do it. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> one for the juniors exactly. and one for the seniors is going to be very exciting. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so it has been also a little strange that these kids have not seen their upperclassmen go to a prom. So I think it's definitely been, how do I do it? What's going on? What's a prom? <laughs> is there a prom proposal? I, so it's been really weird, but um, I just want to say thank you to uh, the community. Um, and I hope these kids have an awesome and safe time. Yeah, and our APTO has done wonderful work to develop these and to work with our, you know, businesses in town, and we're really excited about it. Yeah. So, so this is that's really cool. So, in, in 1986, at the Creighton Prep uh, High School prom, um, we had our our, pro, our post prom party, and um, and the the raffle prize, the grand raffle prize, was a Kawasaki 350. <laughs> 250 three-wheeler. I was the recipient. Of that. It's still in my parents' garage to this day. So those memories, I'm sure there would be wonderful memories coming from this one too, and that one what stuck was, with me. What was more risky, the post-prom party exactly. or the Kawasaki? Uh, well, the Kawasaki's. It's it's. We've had a, some good times on it. No serious injuries. Yeah. But yeah, it's, Great work. it's awesome to see them having. These great, these great events come back. It really is, yeah. So.
Another shout out for that is that North Reading Transportation, our, our bus company, is donating transportation to and from the event for both nice. events. Wow. Wow. And so I really, yes. and this has been a long standing tradition. Yeah. The drivers, many of the drivers donate their time yeah. uh, for the safety of the students, and that tradition is also continuing. The double hit was interesting. We yeah. had to have an, an additional conversation, but they're happy to do it. And Keith will be right. driving bus And I'm 12. driving yeah. bus 12. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the DJ. Stand I'll up be late. the DJ. Yeah. Did, did you get like a temporary license? Yes. <laughs> Hardly. Yeah. You don't want me behind the wheel. <laughs> 75 foot bus. All right. Anything else? That brings us to the personnel report, which is in the packet. Yeah, so just one announcement that um, Michelle Capalbo, the long standing admin assistant, um, has left our district. Um, to take a position at the Mass Fire Academy. She's been interested in um, securing a finance position and she was able to do that. Um, so she, she, we were sad to see her go, happy for her um, new endeavor, um, but she has done tremendous work, has been a great support to our families, our teachers, our students over the past 20 years, has trained a number of principals and um, will be missed. <laughs> and Sean has shed some tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was one of the people who I kept in very close touch with over when I left from here and was in Westwood for 10 years and was happy to return back. And we're sad to see her go, but happy for her success. We're really excited for her. Uh, communications, we have none at this time. Bills and payrolls will be online. And agenda items for next month, we have a few. North Pro South Blue Music Association, Applied Arts Department presentation, Social Studies presentation, Election of Officers, and an Athletics update. Any other ideas for next month? Seems like plenty. Can, can I make a recommendation instead of having two presentations from two departments? Yes. Mm -hmm. It seems like history and social science have presented a number of occasions over the past couple years. Um, I don't know if it's the will of the committee to have just one of those presentations take place. I'd be happy with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Applied arts is always a lot of fun. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's anything else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So with great reluctance. <laughs> uh -huh. Motion to adjourn. Second. By Dan. Second. Second by Sean. Discussion, all in favor? We are adjourned. This is it. I came mm -hmm. to sleep. <laughs>